Good morning, Your Honor. I represent uh, Joe Johnson. My name is Eric Kirk, K-I-R-K. Good morning, Your Honor. This is Jennifer Mahar. I represent the defendant, Theory, Inc., Delaware Corporation. Thanks. I just spell your last name for the record. M-A-H-A-R. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we are here today for uh, attorney's fees for two matters. One, the uh, motion to refer the action to the Attorney General for Enforcement. Uh, the plaintiff filed that was denied, and then uh, second for the motion to dismiss that was um, motion to dismiss that was granted, and any attorney fees that result from that. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay, I will uh, hear you, or we will hear you uh, on that. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we've moved pursuant to Maryland Rule 1341 um, for an award of attorney fees in this case. That rule is going to support the award of experience if the court finds that Mr. Johnson's conduct in maintaining this action was in bad faith or without substantial justification. Your Honor, the record in this case demonstrates that Mr. Johnson's conduct in this case was the epitome of bad faith and without substantial justification. Um, the, the first amended complaint was dismissed on the basis of a judicata. And in this case, Mr. Johnson filed numerous um, pleadings that were meant to harass and were done in bad faith and without substantial justification. Essentially, Mr. Johnson is a uh, vexatious litigant who has a history, when you look at the court's docket, of filing number, numerous cases over the last 10, 15 years. And um, Spearing is now just the latest victim of that pattern of behavior. And that same pattern of behavior was brought to bear in this case. He simply has no respect for the court or public resources that have gone into the, um, having to deal with this case, as well as the attorney expense that my firm has had to incur to defend Spearing. His conduct has been harassing, to say the least. He's crossed the line in, a num in so many ways. Um, he's filed discovery in this case that succeeded the scope of permissible discovery. We had to file a motion for a protective order uh, so that we didn't incur those costs and try to mitigate the exposure. Uh, he named additional defendants to this case um, who are located in Texas, California, or Florida uh, who had no uh, involvement with the uh, allegations in this case. Uh, some of them were high. Uh, ranking executives in various uh, corporate bodies and then uh, even an individual who wasn't related to any of the uh, companies. Uh, he sent process servers out in the middle of the night tracking down his people. I got calls from uh, an 80 year old gentleman who happened to have uh, a similar name and was like the father of one of the people who was being tracked down. So it was just, just complete harassment. Um, he also filed a motion to, as, as the court noted just a moment ago, a motion to refer this case to the Maryland Attorney General. And again, that's harassment. He's trying to uh, threaten with something happening from the Attorney General's office. And of course, we had to uh, oppose those motions. And um, most recently, which we brought to the court's attention in our filing in the opposition uh, to his motion for reconsideration, he even tried to bully me. He has, as I submitted to the court, he sent a letter to me on Monday demanding that I basically rescind all the pleadings in the case, withdraw this motion, and if I didn't do it by the end of the day on Wednesday, he was going to make a bar complaint against me. That, Your Honor, is crossing the line. That is just the pure evidence of uh, bad faith. You, you just filed that? I did not see that. Yes, it was attachment one to our opposition to the um, motion for reconsideration. To which, I'm sorry, which one? Because he's got two cases running at the same time. And I, <laughs> I've ruled on multiple uh, okay. cases. So in the, um, uh, so he filed a motion to rehear and reconsider. And we filed an opposition uh, to that motion to rehear, which we filed um, with the court on uh, March 26th. Exhibit 
to that uh, document is the letter dated March 25th that Mr. Johnson mailed to me, emailed to me. And he asked me specifically to make sure you were aware of statements in his letter, so that's why it's submitted to the court so you can put the record. But he basically said that, quote, accordingly, unless you take these corrective actions no later than Wednesday, March 27th, a formal ethics complaint will be filed against you with the Maryland Attorney Grievance Commission relating to your conduct that is described in the preceding paragraphs of the correspondence. Direct threat, Your Honor. Hold on a second. Let me just pull that up. He said on the 26th, in exhibit number of which, on one Johnson letter? Yes. Yeah, I didn't see this one. Oh, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right here. That's not a question. Now, let me just ask, Counselor, are you aware of this letter? I'm only aware of it after the fact, Your Honor. I did not authorize or have any knowledge of that letter until it was delivered. So this letter is on March 25th. This is um, after my ruling in the case where I made specific findings regarding these very facts that he's speaking of in the letter. And uh, uh, he's indicating that you've misrepresented. And actually, I'll just make a point that the court made specific findings. I looked at uh, the district court case, district court case number D05 CV 23029022, while I was making my ruling with regard to what happened in the district court in the procedural history. Um, and so my ruling was based on that, as well as the arguments of both parties, but it was specifically based on the procedural history of what happened within the district court. And I note that because in his letter, he indicates that. Uh, Despite your, uh, these operative facts, you repeatedly misrepresented to the circuit court in the above proceeding litigation that the new complimentary GPS tracking device that your client first installed in the undersigned vehicle on April 22, 2022, to resolve this complaint was alleged, alleged in, allegedly in settlement of claims. And so I reviewed all the documents that were submitted when I made uh, my ruling. If my ruling was uh, you believe my ruling to be inappropriate, sir, you were supposed to file an appeal. And I'm sure that your attorney advised you of that, your right to appeal, and the dates uh, the days that you had to file the appeal after our last hearing, which was on what date? Was that on, uh, that was last month, wasn't it? March 12th. On March 12th, earlier this month. Um, so, and I'm assuming, counsel, that you did do that to advise him of his right to appeal. You talked about a 30-day period to appeal your ruling. I think there was maybe a little bit of uncertainty because there is this attorney's fees hearing. So, if that constituted the final order in this case, your disposition of the hearing today, or the 12th, I think there was maybe a little confusion about when the appeal period started. So, it run. was going to be today because what I said was I would not dismiss the case until today. But my point is, I made an oral ruling as to what my final ruling would be, and I'm sure that you advised him, just as you said, that he would have a right to appeal, and this letter is contrary to that. He's, 
I, I heard evidence. I made a ruling and said that that ruling would be reiterated in writing today after I heard the attorney's fees. I said that on the record. Um, so I am a little bit uh, confused by this letter that your client has written. I understand that you did not have anything to do with the letter. Yes, um, and I'm trying to understand if you've discussed this with your client. I have not discussed the letter per se. I've discussed his appeal rights. Um, as I said, I only became aware of the letter after the fact. I, I think I want, have you, have you read it? I've read some of it, yes. Can you print out Exhibit 1 from uh, on that 26, please? I, just, I think I'd like you to step out and speak to your client about the letter first. Uh, there are, I, mean, I think you need to read the letter in its entirety, especially since uh, you represented him during the last hearing. You can fully advise him based on what he's written here. And before we move for, forward any further today, I think you probably need to do that. I would be happy to do that, Your Honor. Okay. And um, just that? Okay. Uh, just uh, for way of clarification, uh, my appearance in this case is, is a general one. There was a limited appearance filed er erroneously, I think, by my office. We later corrected that to a, to a general appearance. Okay. I have since filed a motion to withdraw the 15 days. Yeah, that was a little confusing. I wasn't yeah. sure what. So, so I would ask you to consider that motion to withdraw, but I am here with Mr. Johnson today. I intend fully to represent him. I've briefed this case. I've filed an opposition to the request for fees. Oh, you're asking to withdraw for today? No, after today. After today. Okay. After, the, after you have ruled on these proceedings. Okay. We can consider that then. Let me see. Make sure it's right. Okay. All right. And attached with that is uh, everything else from the district court. So I'll just give you the entire packet, which she put as Exhibit 1. Yes, okay. Thank you. All right. You can take your time to speak with your client when you're ready to come back in. Counsel, did you have an opportunity to speak to your client? Your Honor, I have discussed the uh, March 25 letter from Mr. Johnson to Ms. Mahar uh, with uh, Mr. Johnson. I have advised him in accord with Maryland law on, uh, on this letter. He has uh, authorized me uh, and, and specifically stated that he uh, withdraws this letter. He wishes it be given no future effect and he has no intention of uh, pursuing any of the steps outlined herein. Is yeah. that correct, Mr. Correct. Johnson? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. And so, um, what is the date that you filed that? The letter is dated March 25. So, Mr. Johnson, as I explained to you at the last hearing, um, if you have an attorney of record, you have to uh, utilize your attorney when you want to file things. And normally something like that uh, should not have been accepted because you have an attorney of record in your case. And so uh, you're not allowed to file things unless it's through your attorney, unless you don't have an attorney. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. So we're ready to continue. Um, yes, Your Honor. So as far as the legal that we want to happen in this case, paragraph 7 of our motion for award of attorney's fees lays out the um, defense of pleadings for which we had to research and draft um, there on the pages 3 through 4. And um, responding to those motions, filing these oppositions, took more time than typically you would have because um, we heard the Mr. Johnson was filing those pro se and while he is a well experienced litigant, he doesn't um, with the law to his own means, he doesn't uh, follow the record, he makes arguments that spend a lot of time trying to have to unwind and get uh, support so that we can have full candidates on our part with the court. Um, the attached to our motion is an affidavit from myself laying out the individuals who were involved with um, legal efforts and exhibit A to the affidavit is a list um, detailed narrative of the work that was undertaken, uh, broken out by timekeeper and by um, hours and fees. This is just for, you're speaking of um, Exhibit A, which is just for the um, Attorney General motion? Uh, no, Your Honor. So when we, after our hearing last week, when the court said, I'm going to look at this globally, we filed our motion to work for attorney's fees, and we um, put forth a global request. 
So exhibit A to that motion, which was filed on um, March 16th. Um, oh, okay, I was looking at something from the 26th. Okay, yeah, so March 26th was our opposition. So oh, we right. motion to reconsider, and we supplemented by asking for the um, cost for that. So, so what we're looking for, what we're requesting from the court, is our filing on March um, 15th, which is, the, that accumulates $84,321 broken out on um, Exhibit A to Exhibit 1, which was my affidavit. And then what you were looking at from the 26th, we asked for another $8,172, which is broken out. So, hold on one sure. second. Okay, so on Exhibit A, I just have uh, the written motion. Oh, no, here it is. It popped up now. Okay. Okay, I see it. Okay, and so um, can you please, it says yourself, and then uh, Mr. or Ms. Marlis is an associate. Marlis, yes. And then Rounds is? Uh, he is on counsel with my firm. Okay, so you have $84,000, and so some of the work is duplicative, I'm assuming, that your associate did something and the council had to look over it and revise it and things of that nature. Is that correct or incorrect? Um, it's, um, when I say it's duplicative, you you look at the, um, the effort. So our associates were doing research, and then they were doing the drafts, and then I was um, either add my own comments and uh, research with my own knowledge. So it was, I guess I'd say it was a team effort and I was conscious not to be, as you say, the duplicative as part of, I pushed out as much work as possible to my associates doing initial first draft of research and then I bring to the table oh, I see. finalization. So that's how we have it broken out. And you can see... What's the hourly fee? That on the second, third, page, last page? If you go to the very last page, you'll see that my, my rate for this... Oh, is 750. Yeah, and my 50 down to 400. And you'll also see the breakout. We had 176 hours, of which 66 is my time, and the rest is pushed down to the associate at the $400 rate. Okay, let me see what our council did. So, for instance, you have. Uh, 120, you worked on the motion to quash, and then, um, I'm sorry, you're the um, of counsel worked on the motion to quash, then you, and then of counsel for eight hours on a motion to quash, and then 2.5 hours for you, and then another 1.7 hours. That, that seems to be excessive. Which motion to quash was that for? That was, Your Honor, the motion where they uh, were. Uh, he filed a motion trying to go after the corporate individuals. But how long was that motion and what did you do? I think I need some more explanation for something like that just because that looks duplicative but if you're telling me that they did very specific things that's different. Yes, so, so Mr. So with regard to the motion to quash, Mr. Mouse took the lead in doing the legal research that involved looking into corporate law uh, because uh, Mr. Um, Johnson was making arguments about um, corporate status under um, uh, under um, so he was he was trying to say that because Spearing Inc. first he was making an assertion that Spearing Inc. had to be registered in Maryland, which wasn't true, and then he was saying that because they weren't registered in Maryland, that somehow they were forfeited. So that involved research of Delaware law and Maryland corporate law, and the surrounds did that and did that research and presented to me a a draft, which I then went back and um, did a little bit more follow-up research and then finalized the draft. Um, we also obviously had to get input, involved also getting input from our client because um, he was introduced, Mr. Johnson was introducing issues that were not um, briefed in this case as far as you know, corporate structure. So that was also part of what uh, Mr. Rouse was doing that I did not do. And how long was that motion? So that motion, Your Honor, and as far as pages? Yes. Thank you. 
after that motion was filed on January 25th, there was the motion that was um, two pages and a memorandum of law that was uh, eight pages followed by an affidavit that we had to get from the client um, as well as some other uh, documents we had to um, gather up and attach. But I have that paper right here. So you're saying that was about 18... Uh, 18.8 yeah. hours is what that adds up to for the motion yeah. to quash. Okay, let me just look where I saw that again. I'm looking at, uh, and I'll have, and counsel obviously you can argue against that, but I'm looking at the motion to dismiss, and given uh, what the court saw, that looks to be reasonable, but I'll wait for your argument, counsel, to tell me if you don't think that the work for the motion to dismiss was reasonable or not. Um, and there's another, oh, that's the same one, okay. Okay, so I see you have multiple motions filed at the same time. So on February 5th, your uh, counsel is working on the motion to strike and the associates working on the motion to refer to the general, uh, Ameri I'm sorry, Attorney General's office. Okay. What else would you like to tell me about your bills? I've looked at them again now. it would be helpful for us is if you could go through and tell us the type of work that you had because this is not uh, a normal attorney's fees this is a large amount so if you could just go through and explain what type of things you did with each one sure so um, okay so um, we dressed the, so the motion to dismiss with the the motion to dismiss the complaint and then the motion to dismiss the first amendment and so that involved researching each of those accounts, um, finding out the, the law, coming up with the arguments. We had a motion for judicata. We also had um, other grounds that were based on um, just whether or not he sufficiently stated the cause of action. Um, so we had all those accounts, and those were laid out in our um, briefs for that, um, which had a memorandum of law that was fully briefed, plus um, attachments. Um, I think it was probably about like 12 exhibits to each of those motions. And that effort was largely done by um, my associate, Mr. Marulis, and then myself, again, coming back in on the lizard grass. Um, we then had the motion for a protective order to stay discovery. Um, that, again, was done largely by Mr. Um, Marulis, and those are the entries that, that was filed on December 15th. Um, So, um, actually, so the entry on December 14th, uh, I worked on a motion for a protective order, uh, also worked on a motion to dismiss, and then I also a telephone conference with the client to discuss what we were going to file. Um, and this is a rule of, uh, yeah, I guess I was handling most of that one. That was on the 14th, or on the first Sunday, it was filed on the 15th. Um, on the 15th, um, the next thing we did was um, opposition to the plaintiff's motion for immediate sanctions and to deem request for admission admitted. Um, we then had to oppose that motion um, because he was trying to say that we had 
and did it on the discovery request. Um, and that was done by our associates. Um, down around December 28th, uh, where it says I had to review the court, court docket and speak with the client. One of the things that was going on in this case, Your Honor, was that uh, Mr. Johnson was filing, at around that time, Mr. Johnson filed a pleading with the court and he unchecked my name. <laughs> from the so she did not get notice. I didn't get notice. I had to call MDAC. We had to figure out all what was going on. So after that, I had to keep looking at the docket to, to uh, monitor it because Mr. Johnson took the position that I had to do look at the docket every day and don't count it getting served. What, uh, when was this? This is um, around the end of December when that happened. December 28th, I think it was. Okay. Um, and you'll see that again also like January 10th, I had to review the court docket again. Um, and when were you successful in, in getting, well I guess you put it back on but you weren't sure if it was going to be unchecked again or what happened? I just had to continue monitoring and once I, I filed an objection with the court, I think um, Mr. Johnson corrected his way, at least in this court. In the, this report was something else and still doesn't serve him down there. But he just, he just doesn't, he's not consistent with what he does. So I always have to check the docket. I just don't know what's going to happen. Um, let me see. So then we had um, the beginning of January, uh, you'll see January 17th, we're working on the opposition to the motion for sanctions, uh, which we filed. Um, that was the 17th and 18th. Um, on the 19th, Mr. Johnson filed his opposition, his reply, so of course we had to go through that and figure out what was going to happen and talk with our client. Um, we talked about the entries from 120 through 125, um, that's the motion for questions we just spoke about. Uh -huh. uh, 126, um, that is the motion for protective order, and in that, we had a couple things going on. One, we filed a motion for a protective order to redact addresses because Mr. Johnson, as I mentioned, brought in those three individuals and put their home addresses into the court record. And of course, there was much concern about whether or not there was going to be harassment. So we filed a motion which was granted um, for that. And that was done largely by Mr. Rural Associate on the 26th. Again, he was researching to find basis to support our motion of drafting. Um, okay, uh, around January 31st, um, Mr. Johnson filed a motion to strike some of our pleadings. So you'll see um, on January 31st, we're working on an opposition to the motion to strike. And then we're also starting to work at that time on the opposition to plaintiff's motion to refer to the Attorney General. And this was the motion to strike what that was filed by the plaintiff? Motion, responding motion like to strike our pleading. Uh, and I think it was, what he was saying was our, our objection to him naming the three individuals that we felt should not have been named, he was saying we were untimely in making that objection, so he filed a motion to strike, so we had to respond to that. Um, it was just, you know, it was just one of those cases where, as I call it, call it a whack a mole case. We'd do one thing and then you'd pop up and then we'd have to <laughs> do something else. And it just is not like how normal litigation would go. Um, the, attorney general, the attorney general activity is um, 2-5. Yes, yeah, so that's 2-5, that two, two, two. is 2-12. So all the activity you see at the beginning from like, um, Starting on 2 2. Mr. Morrill listed most of the re research for that. So again, I have Mr. Rounds working on the squash, and Mr. Morrill did uh, research and drafting under my supervision. Um, and then also, he was, uh, had to do research about um, attorney fees, because we were asking for that um, and doing that, that part of the request. Um, And then we also had um, Mr. Johnson also filed a motion for 
partial summary judgment, and so we had to file a motion for protective order. That went in on 2-15-2024, which the court ran on 2-16. So that's where you see, uh, starting down around, um, 2-14, we're on motion for protective order, we're in motion for partial summary judgment. Um, and this took, so, I see my time during the, again, supervising, doing some initial drafting, Mr. Merkel is doing all the research, um, and drafting. And who is Wallace Terrell? On um, 3-8? Okay, so Mr. Terrell is an employee of Experian, and Mr. Johnson, in opposition to our <coughs> motion to dismiss the First Amendment complaint, Mr. Johnson made a representation that he did not um, ever see the uh, contract for the device that he was alleging wasn't working and had the arbitration clause. And so Mr. Terrell, who oversees all the company records, we had to have him prepare an affidavit, which we submitted to the court as our uh, reply to his opposition. And so that's what we were doing at that point. And that involved, again, I had to do all this research of getting the corporate records, finding where um, Mr. Johnson's electronic signature was, all those things that we pulled together for the affidavit. And then on March 11th, that's when um, Mr. Kirk becomes involved. I have a conversation with him and then I'm preparing for the hearing that happens on the 12th. Now, as far as the um, Attorney General, the opposition to the motion to refer to the Attorney General, which you had um, mentioned earlier, those costs are included in this exhibit that we're going through, but those items we previously submitted, and those amount to seven thousand two hundred eighty-one dollars. But that's within this eighty-four thousand, right? But if you wanted to know what specifically was with that. And then, as far as um, yeah. you know, since our last hearing, Mr. Johnson filed um, his motion to rehear and reconsider, which the court denied yesterday. Um, we filed on um, the 26th, which we were looking at. We filed this um, nine-page memorandum, um, and that's when we also included the supplement, which again has an exhibit one, which has the activities for that. Um, breakdown, which was $8,172, which involved, again, legal research to these new arguments that Mr. Johnson was making about um, the effect of arbitration versus judicata. Um, so we had to uh, research that very bit, and, and that between myself and Mr. Mugulis, that was 16 hours of work. And that was filed also not by Mr. Kirk, but by the plaintiff? Correct. And that's when I, when we filed our opposition to plaintiff's motion to rehear and reconsider, we brought to the court's attention initially that um, the pleadings that he had filed, he had filed three pleadings without um, Mr. Kirk's involvement. In fact, when I looked at MDEC, I'm not even sure if he served Mr. Kirk with those pleadings. Um, so it tells me Mr. Kirk wasn't involved. Um, but at that time, my understanding was that Mr. Kirk had a general appearance in the case, and that's um, what he placed on the record the last time we were in court. But he also filed afterwards. He had filed paperwork before I filed my motion that said there was a general appearance. Understood. Yeah, and there was again it appeared based when I read the pleading, it appeared there was something going on with the clerk's office. There was someone calling in and asking his pleading to be dismissed. But I'm not sure about all that. But anyhow, I had asked for those motions to be struck, but um, the court denied the motion on the grounds. But that, that was all called out in the uh, motion. So I do understand you know, the court's concern that what we've asked for here is, is, a, is a lot of attorney's fees, but it is uh, representative and reflective of all the constant, you know, something was filed without justification or in bad faith, we would have to respond, we'd have to like unravel it, we'd have to find all the case law that shows that Mr. Johnson's um, 
twisting of the law wasn't supported, and then as soon as we would file, he would come back with another reply or a motion to strike, and it was just constant. It was just not as, as so much motions practice and something while we were waiting for a motion to dismiss on a case that should never have been brought. And so we ask, Your Honor, that you take all those factors into consideration and make what you believe is the appropriate attorney award fee in this case. Because I think based on the conduct that's been demonstrated by Mr. Johnson and his, his just behavior, disregard for this court and public resources, um, that the application of this rule is well deserved in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kirk, before you begin your yes. argument, I just need you to put on the record so we clearly have an idea of what happened with your appearance. As I recall, when we were back in court, I think, was that the 12th that we were in court? March 12th, yes. March 12th. At that time, you said that um, you had a limited appearance just for the purposes of hearing um, those motions filed, which was the motion to dismiss, and then the attorney's fees as a result of that. Is that accurate? I, I don't know that we had that specific discussion. Uh, my, uh, my understanding of the record, Your Honor, and there was some confusion in my office, is that we filed a general appearance in this case, uh, and then erroneously filed a limited appearance. Um, Your office did? Yes, my office did. Uh, okay. Uh, it, it, because I think you said that after this was over, that he would have to, um, well, that you were only in for this part of the case, these motions. I thought that's what you said. And if there was something else that happened after, he would need to retain you. I thought that's what you said at the very beginning. Uh, no, no I, I, I do not believe that. that okay. Well, or maybe I thought that because the limited appearance was in the file. And I agree that that created a lot of, a, a lot of confusion, and there was an error on, on my part and my office's part. I filed a general appearance. We then filed a limited appearance, which is incorrect. I immediately corrected that by filing an amended notice of general appearance on several occasions. I agree with what counsel said. Something was going on. Somebody had been contacting the clerk's office asking for that appearance not to be entered. I uh, see. But, but my intention in this case has always been to generally appear and to defend Mr. Johnson or prosecute his case as it may be, and your, generally. And your understanding with your client was that you would prosecute the case or move forward with the case and represent him? That was it was in a general appearance and not a limited appearance. I, we, we certainly had those discussions, yes, Your Honor. And I appreciate there might have been some confusion, but I, I do believe that at a point that was clearly uh, resolved. Um, it, so I uh, appeared and, and argued the motion to dismiss on the 12th. I, I filed or authorized only one of the pleading in this case, and that's the opposition to the motion for fees. Um, when we had the hearing the motion to dismiss, we specifically coordinated today's date with the court. Correct. Um, and I, I obviously, you know, coordinating the hearing, I had every intention of appearing at that hearing and, and briefing it and, and, and being prepared for it. So that has always been my uh, intention, and, and uh, I think the record reflects that as well. But as far as what has been filed, I can say that I've filed a, a motion to uh, the opposition to the fee request today uh, and an appearance, and a general appearance. Those are the documents I have filed and authorized in this case. Uh, the opposition, opposition to defendant's motion for award of fees yes. that was filed the, on the 25th. Is that the same document or is there a different document? That is correct. Okay. And attachments there too. Okay. So, and I think um, with regard to the other pleadings, I did not strike them because I was unclear. And so, I'm clear now at this point. So what is your request, counsel, with regard to those other pleas that were filed by your client that have been responded to now by uh, the defendant? Uh, if the court feels it appropriate, they should be set for hearing at a, at a separate time. Set for a hearing on what? So I've already ruled on his reconsideration, on the reconsideration. I denied that. But she was asking that the other, let me just go back to that page. Um, since you're saying that you only filed one. So after we were in court, um, defendants filed a motion for award of attorney's fees on March 15th with an affidavit of uh, counsel of record who's here today. Yes, sir. And then, um, in supporting exhibits, and 
Myers Hold on one second. Um, and then it says notice of rejected submission. Um, and it says submission filed in error. Johnson dash second amended entry of appearance 31524. Attorney called and stated that submission was submitted in error to the clerk's office on 315 2024. And so you're saying that you did not make that I did call. not. And I filed a line with the court correcting that, that my office never contacted the clerk's office and asked that anything be taken out of the record. I, Understood. I, don't, I don't know who made the call. Someone identifying themselves as an attorney of record. Uh, what it, says. it says an attorney called. But you're saying that was not you or anyone from your office. That is, is that correct. correct? That is correct. It's not me, Your Honor. Understood. And then... Um, Then there, let's see. Then I signed the order with regard to the hearing, uh, or not that signed, I guess they docketed it. My order from the 12th, they docketed it on the 19th that said, that actually, um, I take it back. So I forgot that I did sign this. So it actually does start from the 19th, the date it was docketed. Because what I said, I misspoke, what I said was, the dismissal was done, but I would not close the case out until we uh, close the case out statistically until we finish the attorney's fees. So it's from the 19th, the date it was docketed for the appeal rights. Okay, so the, the, the appellate right, uh, the appeals period for this case starts on March 19th. The date it was docketed. And on that order, it says that the first amended complaint is dismissed with prejudice per the court's finding of race judicata. Defendant may submit a statement of its costs and expenses, including attorney's fees for the court's consideration and ordering plaintiff to reimburse such costs and expenses to defendant. And that's consistent with what we talked about at the hearing when I made the ruling. Uh, so then that, let's see. Then on 319, after um, so on 319, there's a motion to rehear and consider that's been filed by Mr. Johnson after having some person, not you, not defense counsel, but someone identifying themselves as an attorney saying that you were not the attorney of record in the case. And so then Mr. Johnson has now filed on 319 a motion to rehear and reconsider. And at the time, as the court said, I was unclear, and that's why I did not strike the pleadings. And so I wanted to put that on the record today. But this motion to reconsider then should not have been filed because you were still the attorney of record on March 19th. Uh, yeah. Is that accurate? Your Honor, uh, Mr. Johnson is showing me a, a, a transcript. Um, and uh, I, yeah, there was some co there was some confusion over my a transcript of of the March twelfth hearing. Um, is it a certified transcript? It's on the front. I I he's and I I know there was confusion and apparently the confusion is mine. I had talked about I was appearing for purpose of arguing the motion today. You had asked me if that was a limited appearance, and I said yes, I believe that, and you said it's dismissed. Uh, and I said, yes, yeah, so it's moot now. And then we went on to reschedule. We went on to schedule today's hearing. And then subsequent to that. Well, the word moot means the limited appearance is moot, right? That's how I read that. If it's even a, I don't know if that's a certified okay. copy or not. But yeah. uh, if we're, I, as I recall, and obviously you would not have, as you said, cleared your calendar if I had not told you. And I, I would not have, I don't believe I would have let you out of the case at that point because the, the pleading was not complete. Meaning what she filed, um, the attorney's fees was related to the motion to dismiss, and I said I would separate the two. So I believe there's more to the transcript than that. And if you'd like to get, oh. if you dispute that as his counsel, if you'd like to get the transcript, uh, a certified copy, uh, the court is happy to look at all of that. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that that's necessary. Um, I think Mr. Johnson was confused about the nature of my appearance. 
Um, I, I did tell the court that it was a limited appearance that was immediately thereafter converted to a general appearance based on my communications and correspondence with Mr. Johnson and my representation to the court that I would appear here today and be his counsel throughout the remainder of this case. And to be clear, the court has to be the one to let you out of the I case. Just, right, I can't now, I'm that. explaining for Mr. Johnson's purposes that the court has to let him out of the case once he's in, and the case for these purposes was not complete. Uh, because we still have the outstanding attorney's fees that was related to the original motion. In their original motion to dismiss, they asked for attorney's fees. I just separated the two because, as you recall, the hearings, you had two hearings that day with another company as well that just by chance happened to be on my docket. Um, there was another judge uh, who was out on leave, and her cases were assigned to me. So I had not only the original case with you, which was the thin computer case, but then I got this case by chance because that judge was out on leave, extended leave, and I received all of her cases. Or not all, but I received all of her cases ending in certain numbers. And so by chance I had both. I set them both on the same date. I had your case. I had other cases as well that day. And I did not have enough time to complete the attorney's fees case. And that's why we picked the new date. Uh, consulting with your lawyer as well as with you, I think I asked both of you if this date worked for both of you, and you both said yes, as well as uh, counsel for the defendant. Okay. Judge, can I... Can I Speak with your attorney first and see if he wants you to respond. Yeah, I, no, I, I did. I said it was a limited appearance uh, on the record, and that was later corrected to a general appearance based on my correspondence with Mr. Johnson. You agree, Mr. Johnson? There would be no reason why I would be asking him to pick the date to see if it worked for him if he was no longer in the case. Um, Judge, I, I think what I understand is, is that on Mark, the same day the hearing was to be heard, there was actually a limited appearance that was entered by my attorney. I but a limited appearance is for the purpose of hearing right. the motion. That is correct, Judge. And the I motion was, was for it? to dismiss and for attorney's fees. Right. And the attorney's fees portion had not been litigated. Right. And so once I got that understanding, and the, uh, actually the original transcript, Judge, it has been filed on, on the record. So that it was filed, I think, on March the 25th. But in any event, it was my understanding that it was a limited appearance because that's what I was served with when through MDEC. And so from that point, I understood that I was not represented. So I had no other choice but to file these additional... Um, well, I would just point that you right. should pick up the phone and make a phone call to Mr. Kirk to find out and explain, especially since he looked in his... When I said, does this date work for everyone, you were in court when I said that. that is so whatever you received before you got into court didn't matter because on the record in court I asked both of you did that date work and said that we would not close out the case completely until we finished litigating the same motion. Right. Now she didn't file two separate motions. That was in the same motion. It was in the, in the same motion. And I, I separated the two right. because we obviously could not reach all of those things in one day. Right. And I think Judge, uh, when I read the transcript it does say his appearance was limited and it was only for the purpose of that, to, of that day. Um, and then it goes further. He says that it's now moot, obviously, right. because the motion has not been completed. And he entered a general appearance. You have to read further into the transcript. And you have to, it doesn't matter what you received before. It, ha it matters what the court says. And on that day, the court said that we're not finished with, the with, the com with this motion. And we're going to complete it on March 12th. Does that date work for everyone? You said yes. He said yes. There'd be no reason I was asking your attorney if that date worked for him if he was out of the case. He doesn't want to be a casual observer. Obviously, he's going to be your attorney. And in addition to that, he filed, which you should have received through MDEC as well, he filed indicating that he was the attorney of record. And then some strange person called, I don't know who, but someone else called and then said that he was not. So some type of way that interfered with our clerk's office. But regardless of that, you received that he in his own handwriting said that he was the attorney of record in the case. And you could have very simply picked up the phone to ask him especially, what is it that your appearance entails? What did I pay you to do? Is it to stay in, to not stay in? How long is your appearance for? Those are questions typically that someone who is being represented by someone would ask the person that is representing them. Which is why I originally said in that motion uh, to you that you should have counsel because Again, although you seem to um, understand how to file motions, you understand how to write a motion, um, as I said last time, you have not gone to law school, as I understand. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. And so you're still not a lawyer, and so you can't conduct yourself as one, uh, because that's another 
issue that could be turned into criminal action if you were to do so, or civil action, perhaps, depending on what the action was. But, uh, and that's why I said you should consult with an attorney, because they can answer all of your questions. They're trained in these matters, and they can tell you, especially, as I just said now, your appeal rights. You have 30 days to appeal my decision, which would not have necessitated you filing that other motion, which was improper to file, which has now been withdrawn, so we're not going to consider that. But because of that, your 19 days, so somebody might say, oh, it's the day she signed it. No, the Maryland rules actually say it's the date that it's docketed. So that's why it's the 19th. 30 days from the 19th of March is what you have for your appeal rights with regard to the motion to dismiss. Your appeal rights for your attorney's fees will be 30 days from today's date once it um, has a decision. But your attorney is the one who explains all of that to you. Do you understand, sir? Yes, Your Honor, I do. And he is here, as I said, and obviously you're here with him today. I'm sure that he called you before today to try to talk about this case with you and so that you could move forward with uh, the rest of the case. Okay? Okay. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Kirk, what would you like to tell me with regard to the attorney's fees? Well, uh, I would ask, I think, initially for a point of clarification. My understanding is this would be an evidentiary proceeding. Um, is, there, is there any uh, other evidence that's going to be offered by moving? I didn't know if that was argument or she, the evidence. She has uh, everything that, the exhibits that she attached, I'm assuming. Is that correct? That's correct. She wants to have all of those admitted? Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. They're part of the record because they were attached to her uh, motion? Yes, Your Honor. And is that, is that it? Yes. Okay. Um, Your Honor, the, the sanctions uh, that are sought, the attorney's fees that are sought, are pursuant to Rule 1341, bad faith, unjustified proceeding. Um, the, the cases are clear that that's an extraordinary remedy uh, that should be granted only in exceptional circumstances. Um, the burden of proof in these cases is, of course, on the movement, uh, and the movement has to show one of two things, uh, either that the action was brought in bad faith uh, or that it lacked substantial justification. Um, and they have to convince you, in addition to one of those two things, that within your discretion, this is also a case uh, in which an award of attorney's fees is appropriate. So they have to satisfy the two evidentiary prongs and then the discretionary prong. Um, I would ask you at the outset uh, to consider the facts and the conduct in this case only. I, I do not believe, and, and I would argue to you, that the conduct or, or things that might have occurred in other cases and I understand this. Oh, I, I, I'm not. Those are completely separate cases. In fact, in your case, I dismissed uh, I, I granted the motion to dismiss, but the other case I did not. So they're completely separate cases. Completely separate. And, and there was an argument mentioned about perhaps findings in other cases other than the instant suit, the underlying suit, and, and this suit. Well, the All other right. case she mentioned was the district court case, which the court did find on the record was directly related to this case. The D... Uh, where is my case number? Your Honor, of course, I, I, I don't argue that you can't consider the underlying suit in this suit. There was reference made in argument to findings in other cases about vexatious litigation and conduct in other cases. Oh, you mean with regard to her uh, motion for attorney's fees? With regard to any evidence that she's presenting to the court regarding Mr. Johnson in other cases <coughs> other than the ones before this court, I would ask you not to consider. Which that exhibit that uh, are you speaking of? It just was, so clear. I believe it was an argument, Your Honor. Uh, there was a, a reference to a Judge Green declaration uh, in, in a different case about Mr. Johnson. Today she said this? I thought you said Judge Green had found Mr. Johnson to be a vexatious litigant in another case. No, I don't believe she said that today. Well, I, I may have um, misused what that. If I said it, you could I mean, you could do what you want to do with it, Your Honor. My colleague and I don't recall you saying that. <laughs> But I, I don't okay. recall her saying, I, I believe she said the words vexatious litigant, yeah. but she did not mention any judge or any cases. Okay. I, I just want the court, uh, my only request is the court focus, obviously, on, on the conduct. Absolutely. Uh, in this case. Um, it, the, the case law is clear. It's on the, bur the burden is on the movement to prove bad faith, to prove intent, to prove mental state. That's tally against tally, 317 Maryland, 428. Um, there has been no evidence uh, adduced uh, regarding Mr. Johnson's intent. Uh, I do intend to offer some evidence uh, in, in that regard in our case. 
Um, but but the, the burden in the case is either to, to prove bad faith or to prove, uh, in the language of the case, is that the actions that Mr. Johnson undertook were not fairly debatable, um, that they weren't something uh, that could get to a jury, that it didn't create a jury question, or it was fairly debatable that there might be some type of, of claim there. Um, with respect to the, um, and I think we're kind of, we're, I suggest maybe we're putting the heart, cart before the horse, it's not appropriate, I do not believe, for the court to consider amount of attorney's fees until the, the, the statutory requisites for uh, the 1341 findings have been met. Um, there were some matrixes attached to, uh, to one of the exhibits. Um, they appear to uh, apply to complex federal litigation. Um, the, the, the Maryland rule, 1341, uh, states the factors that should be considered and the case is interpreting it. Um, so with respect to argument uh, as to amount, although I, I would suggest that entitlement has not been shown yet, um, the factors that the, fee, the court would consider in determining reasonable expenses involved in the case, the court analyzes the time and labor required to determine whether the hours spent were reasonable and then considers the skill required, if it's a contingency fee, the amount involved, the result attained, the experience and ability of counsel, awards in civil, similar cases, and the novelty and difficulty of the questions and any time limitations. And that is uh, Brady against Hartford. That's actually a federal case applying Maryland law. 610 fed sup at 735. Uh, other Maryland cases say in awarding fees, the court may exercise its discretion in the light of certain factors, including the evidence submitted by counsel showing the time spent defending an unjustified or bad faith claim or defense, the judge's knowledge of the case and experience required, the attorney's experience and reputation, customary fees, and the affidavits submitted by counsel. So uh, I, I think that the, the judge's knowledge of the case and the judge's experience of the case uh, with the case and other similar cases, in, in my sense, is always the overriding factor in these. This court knows the cases that come in. They know what lawyers in the community charge. And, and I, you, I, I think, uh, I would suggest probably are the gatekeeper uh, looking at an affidavit submitted by an officer of this court about the time that she spent and that her firm spent on the case and determine what's reasonable, what's appropriate based on those factors without resort to any multipliers or matrices or other things that are not contemplated by the rule. The only thing Rule 1341 says is that the court may consider an appendix uh, to the Maryland rules uh, d that deals primarily with, with costs. Um, and that's the uh, guidelines regarding compensable and non-compensable attorney's fees and related expenses contained in the appendix to these rules. Um, but, but again, you're, you're, I, I would suggest um, that that's kind of putting the heart, cart before the horse. So that in the, uh, the, the court um, has to make the findings under 1341 to even get to amount. Uh, and we're at proof on the entitlement stage. And, and I would suggest even on this record, um, that has not been met. Um, the history of the case, and, and I'm certainly going to ask Mr. Johnson some, some questions about this, uh, but I believe the evidence will be uh, that in April of 2019, Mr. Johnson purchased a, a legacy low jack device for $950 from an entity that's not even a party to this action that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, he had that uh, device for about two years, uh, and at that time, Spirion GPS, uh, the, the party in the district court case, uh, assumed the warranty handling for that low jack device. Uh, in, in April of 21, Mr. Johnson, he will testify, tried to get warranty service on that device, uh, and he learned that Spirion GPS did not provide warranty services for that device and he could get, not get the warranty service that he believed he was entitled to. Uh, in March of 22, specifically March 25 of 22, he has a device that he purchased that he feels that he can no longer use. Uh, at that time, he filed the underlying suit uh, against Spirion GPS. That was a small, small claim, seeking $2,500. 
And I, I think it's important to note for the court that was the amount of controversy in the initial district court case. The amount in controversy in this case was $25,000. Uh, at most, I think it's arguable that this case probably should not have even been in circuit court insofar as it sought only $25,000. Um, so he files a suit against Spirion GPS in district court over breach of warranty, not being able to get warranty services. He will then tell you that he files, uh, not a lawsuit, but a, a Better Business Bureau complaint, which he later withdrew. Um, and he filed a complaint over his uh, uh, issues with this device. And not Spirion GPS, but Spirion Inc. reached out to him in an attempt to resolve that Better Business Bureau complaint. From that point forward, uh, he had never heard of, of anyone from Spearing GPS um, again, uh, although he had a lawsuit going on with them. He was communicating at that point solely with representatives of Spearing Inc., he will tell you. Uh, he communicated with an attorney who indicated that she represented that entity named Anna Cochran. Um, and there were discussions uh, related to that Better Business Bureau dis uh, dispute, but w with uh, Ms. Cochran, and as a result of those discussions, a new, different GPS device. So, Council, yeah. it sounds like you're relitigating the motion to dismiss, which was based on all these facts. Uh, I'm just I'm offering these for his I I intent, Your Honor. Um, the court. So it's my understanding, as we went through uh, the facts that day and, and the arguments were made, right. uh, is that he received a check in full and final settlement uh, that was signed off on saying that it was satisfied and then reopened the case. Is that accurate? I don't think that's going to be the testimony here today regarding his intent. No, no, is that what was the, the findings of the court on the 12th? I, the court, it, it just says dismissed on race judicata, Your Honor. That there were no fine. Well, were no counsel, you were present in court when I made my yes. ruling, and I was present. Right. And I'm indicating that I made that based on the district court case and saying that they were the same facts in the district court case. I can't fi make a finding of race judicata without making some statement as to the facts being the same and already litigated in another matter. You, you did say that, and, and that makes that finding race judicata. It doesn't make the facts that underlie that that informed his good faith or bad faith race judicata. This case involves the uh, warrant. That the, and if, uh, let me just make sure I'm clear. Let me just read it again. Uh, there were two things here. First, he talked about Sperian and the company that took over at Sperian, uh, but he indicates that he would have a three-year complimentary subscription, which was, and I did say this on the record, the three-year complimentary subscription, and again, I don't want to relitigate this because you all have, re have litigated this already, and I made a ruling on this, but my, in my ruling, I indicated that the three-year complimentary subscription was part of the 3506 dismissal. And when he said he wanted to set that back in for trial, and then he did not... Uh, notified them. They were not notified. They were taken off of the notification that he had filed that withdrawal or to vacate the uh, the vacate the three five zero six dismissal that they had and set it back in for trial, which they did not receive notice of. Once he received a judgment for that, any agreement that was part of the three five zero six dismissal has dissipated. There is no longer an agreement because you set it back in for trial. That was his choice. I made that finding on the record. He decided to do that. He took their name off. They were removed. Or when he sent the notice to them, he sent it to the wrong address. They did not receive notice of it. A judgment was entered against them. They satisfied that judgment. And it was fully satisfied. And then the same facts were brought here to the circuit court. That's the finding that I made as race judicata on the March 12th hearing. The, Your Honor, the existence of the finding of race judicata is not the same as a finding of bad faith under under Rule One. I understand that, but what you're, I'm saying is that you're relitigating these facts that we've already discussed, and I'm stating that that's what my finding was based upon. 
if he's arguing in this complaint that had a 25,000 jury trial prayer that the three year I'm reading from his um, complaint that was filed in, uh, as a jury trial prayer here in the circuit court count two fraud and deceit paragraph 10 says provide him uh, they represent that they will provide them with a three year complimentary subscription to provide GPS tracking services in his vehicle that agreement was based on dismissing the case once the case was dismissed that was no longer part of any agreement he then sought to get a judgment against them without notifying them that he was vacating the dismissal and then he received a judgment without proper notification to them but before they beside and instead of them fighting that they said we'll just pay the judgment so that's that's what the and that's not what the court has just made up that's what the docket entry states I'm not, I'm not and so that was already litigated argued to the court and that was what my ruling was based on all those facts everything that's in this complaint for twenty five thousand dollars this new complaint that he has filed on the same set of facts that's already been settled in the district court and again if you don't agree with that then that is something that can be raised on appeal Understood. but that was what the court's ruling was based on so I don't want to spend time relitigating this again I've already denied his motion to reconsider uh, even though it was improperly filed but it was denied because uh, it, it was based on things again that the court did not find were appropriate for reconsideration so we are now here for the attorney's fees that they're asking for notwithstanding the argument that you're going to appeal I'm, a, I'm assuming based on your arguments that you wish to appeal my decision which you have every right to do 30 days from the 19th of March uh, for your appeal rights for that uh, they are asking for attorney's fees and again your 30 days for the attorney's fees will start once it's docketed here as well so there are two separate appeals that you can run with regard to this so we can just stick to whether or not uh, on the basis of that I've made a finding you disagree with that finding and I understand uh, that you find that it was not uh, in bad faith but she's indicated that it is bad faith and the court uh, she's arguing to the court today it's in bad faith and I'm just being clear for the record that on the 12th the court indicated that these set of facts in this $25,000 lawsuit that he filed for and asked for a jury trial for in the district court were for uh, the same set of facts where he received a full and final settlement that was fully satisfied by the defendant and the complimentary subscription to receive GPS tracking was only given to him as part of their settlement agreement which he decided not to go along with he is the one who asked for it to be set back and for trial for it to be vacated not the defendant and the court made those findings on the record and, and I do understand that your honor um, but but today we're, we're here on a different matter we're, we're not here on whether or not the case was raised judicata we're here on whether or not shouldn't have been filed at all is what she's arguing should never have been filed is what her argument is is what she is arguing that the court has to receive proof of that and I would argue on this record that that, there, there, that has not been made. There, there is no evidence of bad faith. There is no uh, evidence that these proceedings were not brought without substantial justification. What is the substantial justification? Well, I, that is what I was reciting to you. Oh, I see. You believe okay. that to be a substantial justification. Well, All right, I'll let you continue with your argument. Okay. So in um, so in April of 2022, uh, Mr. Johnson had a new, different GPS device installed in his car uh, by Spirion Inc. Uh, that device stops working in November or December of 2022. Uh, he will testify. He then contacts Spirion Inc., which is a different entity than, than uh, Spirion GPS, about the device. Uh, it is not working. Nothing happens for months. He then files this case, the, dis the, the circuit court case, against Spirion Inc. I think an issue in this case, of course, is going to be what did Mr. Johnson know and when did he know it? Uh, he was not aware and wasn't made aware until this litigation that there had been a merger between the two entities. Um, he's filed the lawsuit, the instant suit against Spirion Inc. because the new replacement device was not working and he had to purchase a new additional subscription which was then terminated. 
So I've, in my opposition to the award for fees, I've attached all of the complaints, uh, or the two complaints as filed. And I think if you'll review those, you see that they do allege different operative events, including events that occurred in the fall of 22 that formed the subject of the second suit. And again, Mr. Johnson is going to testify as to what his thought process was as he did these things. He will testify that when he learned that Spirion Inc. was not registered to do business in Maryland, his belief was the appropriate uh, that the appropriate course of action was to serve the officers and directors, and therefore he added the John Doe defendants and sent out the substitution notices. The court has determined that that was not the incorrect, um, or that that was not the correct course of action. Um, but I, I would argue to you, Your Honor, that that's not the standard uh, for today. The standard must be that that was something that was done in bad faith or had no substantial justification whatsoever, that it was not fairly debatable that that was an appropriate action for him to take. In addition, and similarly, once he learned um, that, that Spirion Inc. was not registered to do business in Maryland, uh, he believed it was appropriate to refer uh, the matter to the Attorney General to investigate their status, which he asked the court to do. There again, uh, the court had determined that that might not have been the appropriate action for him to take, uh, or denied the request that he sought. But uh, again, I would submit to your honor that's so not. Is this argument counsel, or are you planning to put your client under oath? I will put my client under Let's oath. Let's do that now, then, because we have a. And your honor, for the record, can I put an objection to the extent that Mr. Johnson is going to go on and put on testimony of something that the clerk has already said has been reviewed? And I don't have a witness who can rebut. What he's just say. Well, it needs to be limited to what he filed and why. Yes. Um, I have made a ruling already, but it, if I'm to say whether or not he filed something in bad faith, he has to testify. You can take the stand over here, sir. <laughs> Joe Johnson. Is it your full name, Joe or Joseph? It's Joe Johnson. Is that your full name? Yes, Your Honor. On your birth certificate? Yes, it is. And uh, do you have a middle name? I do not. So your, your birth certificate just says Joe Johnson? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay, what is your address, sir? It's uh, 2600 Brinkley Road, Fort Washington, Maryland, 20744. And is that a street address or is that a P.O. box? Um, it's a street address. And that is where That's you physically live, sir? That is correct, Judge. Okay. Go ahead, you may inquire. Thank you. Uh, you know, Mr. Johnson, um, yeah, I understand that you bought a legacy low jack device for $950 back in 19, right? That is correct. And you had some problems getting warranty service yes, on that? Your Honor, again, we're getting into So you, know, you need to find out. I, I'm going to allow you to ask him about the first case. Yes what agreements were made in the okay. first case, why he brought the case back, okay. did he receive the settlement, did he sign off on the settlement, and then why did he file the second one. Not all the facts again, because that's not what this is. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you filed a lawsuit against Spirian GPS in the district court on March 25th, 2022, correct? That is correct. Can you tell Judge Anderson why you did that? On April the 5th of 2009, I had purchased a uh, low, uh, they call it now legacy low jack tracking device and it was installed in my vehicle and I didn't have to uh, pay a subscription for it and it was my understanding Counsel, I need you to direct the questions please what, what claims did you make against Spirian GPS when you brought this? What, 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 were, what were you complaining about? I was complaining that they had breached the uh, warranty agreement with respect to the uh, lo the legacy low jack. And you filed that action for twenty five hundred dollars. That is correct. Um, it, it has been suggested that that claim was la later settled. 
It was not. I had brought the uh, lawsuit against Spirian GPS. So, we're counsel? Yes, ma'am. The court has taken judicial notice of the records of the district court, and I did that at the last hearing. So when you're saying it has been suggested, it's not suggested. It's actually factual. That's what's been filed in the district court. I, at this point, I understand that you'd like to appeal, appeal the court's ruling, but these are documents that have been filed in the district court. There's been a judgment that's been issued against this company for these facts. So you can ask about that, but these are, this is not, it's been suggested if there is a judgment that's been entered, and he filed it uh, while he was self-represented, and he did not serve them notice. Those are all things that the court can take judicial notice of because I've reviewed the pleadings from the district court. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson, you later then filed a second lawsuit against a different entity, against Spirion Inc. Is that correct? That is correct. Why did you sue Spirion Inc.? What, what was your motivation? What was your complaints against them? No, I'm going to object because his complaints are spelled out in his, in his complaint. I mean, who's going to retry the case? Well, the question is why. I can see what the counts are, and so you can ask a specific question as to why. Why did you file the, uh, the suit that we're here on today, sir, in the circuit court for Prince George's County? So it, when I had, had sued the original um, entity, which I understood to be Spear and GPS, before they merged, um, I think they merged in November of, uh, I'm sorry, in April of 2013. All of my dealings were with Spear and Inc. up until uh, that point. It had, uh, they weren't even part of the, the first case that I had filed against Spear and GPS. They, uh, told me that they would install this second device in my vehicle. So this was some, it is hearsay sustained. But counsel, we're getting into hearsay what somebody told him that this entity, I, 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 the court will ask the question. So this entity, you believed you were going to a new, brand new entity to get this, in, this, this low jack on your car? That is correct, yes. So you went to the first entity, and you settled with them, and then you went to a second entity? No, Judge, um, if I can clarify that. So when I initially had a legacy load jack installed in my vehicle in 2019, that was purchased through a company originally called CalAmp. That company sold into Spear and GPS. After Spear and GPS uh, bought that company, they would not service any of the legacy load jacks or honor any of the, the uh, warranty. So I brought the district court case against them. The first one. That is correct, Judge. So in the meantime, Spear and Inc. I filed a better business bureau against Spear and Inc. It was based on the same similar facts because I did not know which one of the two entities was responsible for but the warranty. But you already received a settlement with regard to them not providing the warranty to you. Is that correct? Um, if, can I explain it further, Judge? Well, I'm asking that question. I, I, I did receive from Spear and Inc a check for $2,500 in payment of the judgment that was against Spirian GPS. A judgment that you asked for your agreement to be vacated. It, it, Is that correct? It, the agreement was, 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 there was no agreement with Spirian GPS because it was, I'm dealing with two different entities. I'm thinking that Spirian Inc is responding to my Better Business Bureau complaint. And out of good faith, I, I, I didn't want to have to... I believe to that they gave you $2,500 for a Better Business complaint, well, even though that's not what it said? Well, it, I, I guess I can, if I wanted to explain my yes, thought sir, process, okay. Judge. Sure. So when when I sued Spear and GPS, it was only for $2,500, and that was based on the legacy low jack. Okay, so Spear and Inc. comes around back and try to resolve the Better Business Bureau complaint, and they installed a, uh, the, the uh, second device. There was no monetary uh, settlement or anything in vice. They did it as a compliment. And I, in, I, in good faith, believe that at that time I should just not proceed any further against Spirian GPS because it wasn't appropriate for me to continue with the district court case after they installed the first, or Spirian Inc. came along to resolve the complaint through the uh, Better Business Bureau. So I filed a voluntary notice of dismissal of the district court case, again, in good faith, thinking that Spirit Inc. 
was going to follow through. So between April of 2022, uh, when they installed the first device, then they came, I went back to them and said that device was defective. So in November 22 is when they sent a second person, a technician to my home to install the second device. That was after an agreement that you had with them, is that correct? The, the, agreement, the agreement was that they would install the first device, which was the, the, on April the, the second, on, on April the, the 22nd, they installed the second device and in my vehicle. And warranty on that second device. That is correct, Judge. That was part of the agreement. Right, that, that is correct. And then, and then I think once they, 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 um, they installed it, I withdrew the Better Business Bureau complaint and I also voluntarily dismissed the complaint that I had filed separately against Spirit and GPS. But it was dismissed with a special rule. I, I, it was dismissed. Six dismissals. So that is correct, that Judge. You have reached an outside agreement, and based on that agreement, we're dismissing a lawsuit. Is that it, correct? Judge, the lawsuit that I filed was against Spirit and GPS. I did not file anything against Spirit. And by that time, there was two separate entities. I, at least, um, in, there was, it's from my understanding, there were two separate entities. One was responding to the Better Business Bureau complaint. And the other one, which was Spirit and GPS, who I had served, never responded to it. But I did, like I said, I, in my in good faith attempt to resolve the issue without litigating in the district court, I accepted Spirit Inc.'s offer to install this upgraded device to the old legacy. And they left the device in your vehicle. That is correct, Judge. And then you said that you wanted to vacate the... Agreement. That was only after a certain period of time had elapsed between April and November. November of 22, the device that they installed in April 22, it was defective because it wasn't seen in the required notification. So in, uh, I think it was January or December of, of 2022, I kept asking them to, that, telling them that this device is defective. And we kept going back and forth on emails for two months. So what I did was I, could, I cannot, I didn't want to continue uh, trying to settle the Better Business Bureau spearing. So then I went back to the district court in this, the case involving spearing GPS and I reinstated that complaint against them. Although spearing... You sent it to the wrong address, sir. No, what was that, Your Honor? You sent the when you said you want to vacate it, and you have to do a certificate of service, you sent it to the wrong address. But the Spirit, address that you had not been using prior to that. Is that correct? No, no, no that is incorrect. The only party that was to that case was, was a Spirit and GPS. I sent it to their resident, well, at least at the time I thought it was their Maryland resident agent, which is a list on the Maryland State Department um, of Assessment Taxation website, what their resident agent was. That's where I sent the pleadings. I did not think that I had a duty to send anything to Spirit Inc. because there wasn't a party to the case at all. And so that's why they did not get any of the pleadings that was filed in the district court case. But although I did send courtesy copies to the attorney who I had been dealing with on the Spirit Inc. side, she was. That's how she became unaware of that. And then, so I reinstate the you district. You sent copies of the judgment. What was that again, Judge? Of the judgment. I sent her a copy of everything, the courtesy copies. Of the judgment. Of the, but the, not of you vacating. I sent. The, the, I sent a copy of the mo. If you, the, the court file is. I served the, the motion to for an affidavit judgment on. Spearing GPS at the resident agent address, and I also mailed a copy, a courtesy copy, or when I served on the MDAC through the attorney for Spearing Inc., who I had been dealing with. And all of this is in the file, Judge, for in the district court case where I had sent, the, or at least the MDAC. It shows where I had served Spearing Inc., a counsel who was not in the law in the, the, the GPS case. So in any case, I reinstated the, the dismissal in that case. And, and moved the court for affidavit judgment against Spear and GPS. And then... And you the, were moving for judgment because your GPS didn't work even though you had the warranty? That, that concerned only the Spear and... The, the, the Legacy Low Jack. That's two different devices. The Legacy Low Jack, which was installed back in 2019. No, they gave you a new one after. Right. In, in April 2022 is when, when Spear and Inc. came in to respond to the Better Business Bureau just, complaint. Just so I want to be clear. They had the low jack from 2019. Which was a You said that it is defective, it doesn't work. As part of the agreement, they installed a new one, correct? Well, this, the, the legacy low jack is what was installed in 2019. And what was installed after that? After that was the, the upgraded GPS that was installed by Spirit Inc. Because Spirit the agreement that you had 
when the case was dismissed. Well, That's stated in the agreement, sir. There was no, I've never entered into any written agreement of any kind with Spirit Inc. I, like I said, I Let me go back. What's the case number, uh, counsel, for the district court case? I can go back to it, please. The original district court case is... Your Honor, if I may, I believe it's going to be... It's 0502. No. Let me let your counsel do it. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not on my computer. Um, okay, so the original one was... Um, Spirit Inc. versus Spirit Uh, yeah, the original one, Your Honor, was 0502-0004853. Oh, it's original case number. 0502, what's the rest? Uh, 0004853-2004. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
talking to me and try to resolve the issue. I then say, okay, it makes no sense to continue to try to go after Spear and GPS if Spear and Inc. is going to resolve my dispute. So I just voluntarily dismiss it, but so I wanted to protect... Dismissal would just say, I dismissed the case. You're writing fancy numbers and fancy rule numbers, sir, that indicate that you knew it to be a little bit more than that. I, I, I wanted... No, I, I wanted to be, uh, be able to... The average person would say dismissed. Someone who writes a 3506 dismissal understands that that means there's stipulated terms associated with that, sir. You didn't just say dismiss, and you also said dismiss without prejudice, which means you know a little bit more than the average person probably. But someone who wants to just dismiss it and not move forward would just say dismissed. But you said 3506 dismissal, which means it's dismissed with stipulated terms, agreed upon terms by the parties. And then the rule goes further to say that if an action is settled upon written stipulated terms and dismissed, the action may be reopened at any time upon request of any party to the settlement to enforce the stipulated terms through the entry of judgment or other appropriate relief. And that's what you did when you filed to reopen the case. I, judge, um, can I respond, Judge? You may. So when I filed that, it was only because I was dealing with Spirit Inc. I had, Spirit Inc. was not involved in the case. And I just in good faith thought that filing that dismissal would resolve that case because I did not want to be left out with out recourse, if you will. So I, I spoke with some attorneys about this and they advised me to That's just do... Well, you, sir, you I can't tell me what attorney said. That's hearsay. They're not here to testify. Okay. Your, Your Honor, if I could just... I, I believe that hearsay does inform his lack of Faith, good faith, bad no, faith. No, it, it no, no. It goes to his state of mind. If he is if he wants to put on evidence, if he believes there are attorneys, he could have subpoenaed those attorneys to come in and testify today. I'm not going to allow him to put on hearsay as to what some attorney who has not been named, has never been a party to the case, has never filed any pleadings in any other case. You're the first attorney to file any pleadings in this case for him, so the court will not accept that. Yes, Your Honor. So it's sustained. Okay, so I, I filed the, the uh, Rule 506 dismissal in the case. That is what I did based on what I, the information that I had at the time was the appropriate thing to do. And that is because Spear and Inc. was trying to resolve my Better Business Bureau complaint. And they installed this, this dev their upgraded device on April the 2nd, or I'm sorry, April the 22nd of 2022. In November 15th of 2022, while the district court case was still dismissed, I'm going back and forth with Spearing regarding the updated device that they installed in the, the vehicle because it wasn't working. And so in November 15th, they send someone else out to my house to replace the, the tracking device. Mm -hmm. Then after that, there was some issues concerning the terms surrounding the actual subscription. And we went back and forth, that, and I, my dispute was is that I should not have to pay an additional uh, amount to have this device installed in my vehicle when the original device I had, I didn't have to pay anything further for it. So there was tr we was trying to work out the terms of, 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 the, uh, of the subscription for the vehicle, I mean for the second device. After a reasonable I amount of... I just want to be clear for the record. The reason you say that you had a stipulated dismissal was so you wouldn't pursue the Better Business Bureau? Uh, is that what you're saying? No, I was, no I was going to proceed with my the Better Business Bureau complaint as opposed to going proceeding in the district court because I thought it was... So more what were the stipulated terms then, sir? There were no stipulated terms because I was... So you, you attached that. I, I say that to say because you attached that to your motion to vacate the dismissal. You specifically referenced the Maryland Rule 3-506B of civil procedure and then you say you moved the court to vacate the dismissal. This is your vacate to dismissal. So you note that it was filed pursuant to Maryland Rule 3-506B. You state the rule and then you state what the rule says. Uh, that the court correctly noted that under Maryland Rule 3506B, if an action is settled upon, written stipulated terms, and dismissed, the action may be reopened at any time. You specifically wrote, stipulated uh, upon written stipulated terms and dismissed, the action may be reopened at any time, 
and upon request of any party to the settlement. And then you reference Exhibit A. And Exhibit A is a copy from the clerk's office that says the court is advised that the parties have dismissed this case, the parties, all parties, not just you, the parties have dismissed this case upon stipulated terms on July 14, 2022, under Rule 3506B. If an action is settled upon written stipulated terms and dismissed, the action may be reopened at any time upon request of any party to the settlement to enforce the stipulated terms. You cite this as your exhibit, and it clearly says the parties have reached a dismissal upon stipulated terms, and you put this as part of your records as far as your exhibits in this case. And then you also attach a judge's note saying that it's a matter set back in for trial. And when it was set back in for trial, and I'm sorry, and for this motion to vacate the dismissal, your certificate of service says, I hereby certify that a copy of the foregoing was filed and served on this first day of December on counsel for defendant Ferry and GPS LP doing business as LOJAC through the MDEC filing system, which I, that's what it says. It does not say that you served it to the resident agent. It says you filed it through the system. So if there's someone who's not on the system, who hasn't been a party before, they wouldn't receive notice, which I believe is what counsel argued the last time for the defense. What else would you like to tell me? And so on that, Judge, like all of the pleadings that I filed in the district court case, I was given advice how to proceed in it, and that is the way I proceeded. But Spearing, Inc. was never a party in that case. And Spearing, GPS, when they were served in the case, they did not respond to the lawsuit. So after the back and forth with Spearing, Inc. in November, and then December comes, there's still no resolution. I think that was maybe February of, I think it was February of 2000, February the 7th of 2003, I received an email from another person at Spearing. Her name was Amy Gennaro. And we went back and forth regarding the dispute surrounding the device. Then I think it was after that is when I went back to the district court and asked them to vacate it because Spearing, Inc. had stopped communicating with me. And that is because the person that I had been communicating with Spearing had left the company. And then I felt that it was only appropriate for me to go back to Spearing, GPS, who I had the original device with, and continue my claim against them. Now, after I did that, then Spearing, Inc. reaches back out to me again. I think it was April the 24th after the court had vacated the judgment. And they continued to try to resolve the Better Business Bureau complaint with me. And then on May 10th, the last communication I got from Spearing, Inc. was an email from the same individual. She said her name was Ms. Gennaro. And she wrote, can we just... No, no, you can't tell me what she wrote, sir. Okay, so I received the email from her. And that was after the court had already vacated. And she continued to try to resolve the Better Business Bureau complaint. But by that time, the court had already vacated the judgment back in, I think it was February or March, I'm sorry, March 16th of 2022. And then after that, I got the email from that individual on May the 10th. And then I reiterated, we were going back and forth on the same thing that we had been going back and forth about for about three, four months before I thought it was appropriate to stop me trying to resolve the Better Business Bureau complaint. So then after that was done, then Spearing, Inc. in June of 2023 did in fact send me a check for $2,500 to pay the judgment that had been entered against Spearing GPS. Did you cash that check? Yes, Your Honor, I did cash that check. And before I received the check, I had no knowledge that Spearing, Inc. and Spearing GPS had consolidated or had merged. I accepted the check from Spearing, Inc. only because I thought that they were just satisfying the judgment. And then I reached out to them again, I think it was in August, because the device was still connected in my car from 
from the time they paid it from June to, to August, it was still, the device was still in my vehicle. They didn't mention anything that they was paying, sending me the check in satisfaction of all the claims. Because if they so did that, that, that I understood at the time was only related to my original suit in the district court case. So I felt... And so I just want to be clear, as part of your agreement with them, they agreed to put the new low jack on and also to give you a warranty, correct? That was to resolve the, the, the BB complaint, but then between April... Resolve which complaint? The Better Business Bureau complaint, Jesse. But I, that I, was also your complaint in here as well, right? They, Did they, it, it work? Well, the, the, they, the second device, the first device was the, the GPS, that, I mean the, the legacy low jack that was installed in the vehicle back in 2019. That was a warranty, a breach of warranty because they wouldn't come out and service the device. Then April the 2nd or 22nd of 2022, Spearing installs the new device, which is a totally different device that is totally different from the one I had back in 2019. But they installed that because you complained of the, new, of the old device not working, correct? That is correct, yeah, which, which goes back to why I thought it appropriate to go only, again, to only try to resolve with Spirit because that's the only entity that reached out to me to resolve the dis dispute. So after the court entered the judgment and they sent the check for $2,500 to pay the judgment that was entered against Spirian GPS, then they contacted, the last thing I think I got from them was I tried to purchase the, the, the service from them again. I paid them $270 for the second device to it that they installed in my vehicle in August of, of, of this, that same year. And it, 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 from, from the time they gave sent the check in June to August, the device was active. They didn't send me any notification to tell me that, look, because we're paying this judgment, we're going to terminate our agreement that, that we had to resolve the BB complaint. If I had known that, then I would have accepted the check. So I, in good faith, accepted that check. And so payment. you thought that check was in payment for the Better Business Bureau complaint? No, I'm sorry, in, in payment of the, the, the lawsuit that was against Spirit and GPS. Because at this time, I did not know they had merged in April of, of 2023. But so when they merged in April 2023, they then paid that judgment that was entered against Spirit and GPS. Then I went, then I thought it was resolved. Then when we continued to have discussion after they uh, had installed the second device up to May of last of 2023, the device was still out operating in my vehicle. But there was a disagreement, remained a disagreement about the terms of the, the, uh, of the, the, the new device, the subscription about the new device. Actually, so, hey, I need to pause for a moment. I sure have another judge. case that I need to handle. This was supposed to take really less than two hours, but we've over, gone over two hours now. Um, and I have a case that involves a murder, so I'm going to ask you all to step back. Uh, that's going to take precedent over this. And uh, step back. Are you handling that case? Or is there someone from the side coming down? I think it's me. Okay. Um, is this the one involving Mr. Moon? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that are you all here for the um, Al Al I'm sorry, Stephen Alexander Robinson case? I am, Your Honor. I'm understanding. No, I know you are. I'm asking these family members who are no, all here. Ron Robinson. I'm a, and you're here for the family of the victim or the defendant? Victim. And so I'm assuming that no one called them since they're all here. It's my understanding that Mr. Mooney did not read the defendant, I wonder. Uh, Your Honor, we, there was a writ filed, but he's not here. And it was filed back. I think the writ was late. Was It was the writ for the February hearing, but not for today. And, my and I'm sorry, before, before we start this other hearing, so Mr. Johnson, Obviously, you're on the stand. You cannot discuss your testimony with your attorney. I, just, I know your attorney knows that, but I'm letting you know that. You're still in the middle of your testimony, subject to still further direct examination, cross-examination. You cannot discuss your testimony with anyone, including your attorney or anyone else. Do you understand, sir? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Now we call it number two on the dock, is C16CV2300438, Joe Johnson versus Spirion Inc. et al. Could you answer the record again, please? Uh, Your Honor, my name is Eric Kirk, K-I-R-K. I represent Mr. Johnson. Jennifer Mahar, representing Spirit 8 M-A-H-A-R. Okay, thanks. Come on back up over here, sir, please. Uh, what's that document you have, sir? Looks like a type response. It's, it's the, um, the copy of the affidavit that I filed in this case explaining what I'm 
testifying to. Okay, well, if you need to refer to it, let us know that, but you okay. can't read from it. Okay. Okay, so you just put it down, turn it over, and then if it's appropriate for you to look at it, your attorney will let you know that, all right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Ms. Herb, you can continue with your question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, I think when we left off, there had been a voluntary 3506B dismissal of the district court case, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. Did anything change with respect to you and Spirion Inc. between uh, after that 3506B dismissal was filed? Yes. They after they installed the um, device on April the 22nd, 2022, then they replaced it in November of 2022. In December of that same year, um, they well, there was a disagreement about the terms of the subscription. And explain what, what that subscription is and what the disagreement was. I'm going to object again from going beyond what you were trying to case here. What was the question again? What were the terms of the agreement? Or of the... Uh, the uh, of, of the subscription dispute. I'm not attempting to retry the case, right? The subscription dispute? Subscription. I thought it was, you mean, for the... He has to get he had to get some type of platform to be able to operate the device. So he's talking about at this point the device that was installed in November of 22 that then began to malfunction, and he's going to lead to uh, testify about the circumstances that led, led to him okay. filing an instant case. All right, I'll let you ask him questions. Okay. Okay. So uh, describe to the court what what that malfunction was. Well, in order to use the GPS um, that was installed in my vehicle by Spirian, you have to have a subscription, meaning you have to pay additional fees for it in order to utilize the service. So when they installed it in the vehicle, they did not explain to me that I would have to pay subsequent years to have the same device installed in the vehicle um, in order to function. And so we went back and forth about the terms in December. I never heard anything back from Spirian Inc. I did, however, receive an, a, an email from another entity, and I think her name was Amy Gennaro, but she claimed to have been from Solet. Your Honor, to say that's what she said her claim. Ask another question. Uh, Mr. Johnson, describe what was going through your mind when you filed this claim against Spearing Inc. What, what were your disputes with Spearing that led to the instant suit? So after I had, there was this dispute concerning the subscription, I per actually purchased a uh, three-year, well, once the, 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 uh, the, I received a check from Spirian Inc. saying that the check was to pay the judgment that was entered against Spirian GPS. Months went by that the GPS that Spirian Inc. had installed in my vehicle was still operable. I mean, it, 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 it was operable, but then they, in August, I think it was, it stopped sending signals to where the vehicle was located. So I, I reached out to Spirian Inc. about that, and they could not figure out at that time what the issue was. So, but then I think it came up that I had to deal with their legal department. And, and then I purchased a three-year subscription myself for $270 on August, I think it was the 23rd. They received my payment for the, the subs that three-year subscription in August, but they did not reactivate the device. And so now I, um, I have August a... August of what year, sir? Uh, I'm sorry, August the 23rd. Of what year? Of last year. Of last year. 20, 23? 20, 23, yes. Yes, Your Honor. 8, 23, 23 is the date? Yes, it, Your Honor, that uh, that is correct. And so I paid them the twenty the, the for three year subscription in twenty twenty August the twenty third of twenty twenty three when they discontinued the, the the service, and they charged my credit card for that amount, but they did not reactivate or refuse to reactivate the the device. So I then filed the instant suit in September of that same year alleging that they had retained um, the, the payment that I made for the device and so now I have, I'm without the device and I'm without the, the, the uh, subscription fee that I had paid. After I had filed the suit, then Spirian Inc. 
I think a month or two later, reimbursed the file and the, the, the subscription fee that I had paid for the device uh, or pr paid for the subscription in August of 2023, which is the district court case that was recently filed um, in this case. Then after they refunded it, then I, it really mooted my claim regarding their uh, relating to that transaction. So then I discovered from a third party Just that saying, you're going to object. You cannot tell what you discovered from somebody else. Oh, here's the, uh, ask uh, a question. He's going to ask you a question. Sure. So, you uh, so what, uh, at the moment you filed the, the, the first action in the circuit court case, what were your disputes with Spirian? My, my dispute with them was that they had initially, uh, um, it was my understanding that they had installed the, the, the device in my vehicle to resolve the Better Business Bureau complaint. Then I received uh, a, a check in the mail saying that they were going to pay to set to, to uh, pay the judgment that was entered against Spearin GPS. But at that time, I did not know that Spearin Inc. had been at that time. I think it was April 2nd of 2023. They merged with Spear and GPS, but at no time did I ever speak with anyone from Spear and GPS. Let me just be clear, sir. So you're saying that you received a check for a judgment. Did you have more than one judgment with that company? No, no, Your Honor. It was just one judgment for twenty-five hundred dollars from against Spear and GPS relating to the legacy uh, low jack. And so, why were you saying you were confused by what? I was confused because when I was dealing with the entities, there was two different entities. Spirit. But you didn't have one judgment. You didn't have two that, that, judgments. Yeah, it was just one judgment. Spirit Inc. Um, sent me a check for twenty-five hundred dollars in June of twenty twenty-three. After the the judgment was entered, I think in um, March sixteenth of twenty twenty-three, mm -hmm. and the check at the bottom said it was in payment of the judgment. It didn't say that it was in settlement or anything. If it did, I would never accept it. But was there some other judgment? That's why I'm asking you. If there's only it, one judgment. Right. It was the judgment that was entered against Spear and GPS that Spear and Inc. was paying in because, in my view, I thought that Spear and GPS was legally obligated to pay after the court had entered the judgment. So Spear and Inc. merged with Spear and GPS on April the 2nd. So and no, I'm asking specifically. You have one judgment, right? That is so correct. You're receiving money for a judgment, the one judgment that you had. That is correct, Your Honor. So I don't understand why you were confused as to who the money was from because you only had one judgment. No, I was. What I was trying to explain is that when I received the check from Spirian Inc., at the bottom of the check it wrote um, in payment for judgment, and I accepted the check because I thought it was resolved in my dispute. Concerning the uh, legacy low jack, I in good faith believed that when they installed the the, the second well, GPS. Second. The, the legacy, you're saying for the legacy, that was, um, but your agreement involved the new GPS, correct? Th that is correct. The, the agreement that I had with Spirit Inc. was that they were going to install, in which they did, the uh, second device in the vehicle. Well, and what it, I'm saying is, it, it's the same company then, because how are you? You have one company that's doing something, but you're making an agreement with another company that's not related. That doesn't make. It sense. was there at the time. There were two separate entities, Judge. That's that's what I was trying to say. Two Spe separate entities that did two separate things to your car that were not related in any way. Well, Spirian Inc. installed the second device. Spirian GPS is the one that was relating to the the um, the the, uh, the the complaint that I filed in the district court and for the twenty five hundred. Spirian Inc. became. Took over the company when? In April of 2023, a year a year after all these events occurred, and then in June. When, wait a minute. When did you um, ask to get? When did you vacate the? Um, uh, ask to vacate the dismissal. It was. Um, can I refer to my notes, Judge? Sure. It was in February of 2023. I asked to vacate the, the, the judgment in February 2023. Okay. So no, I'm sorry. I, I moved to the, the vacate the dismissal of the case in December of 2022. And then in March of 2023, there was a default judgment entered against Spirian 
ink. And then and then in April after spearing and ink merged so with wait a minute. So you moved to vacate December twenty two in March of twenty three enough default judgment was entered against Spearing Ink. Spearing GPS. Not Spearing Ink, it's because Spearing Ink was never sued at all in the that underlying case involving the legacy so logic. Spearing GPS. Right, so Spearing and Ink case? Yeah, later on in this this particular action. They paid in April. Well, they they merged on April the second of 2023, June the and, and I'm sorry, they merged on April the second 2023. Mm -hmm. Then in May of seven of 2023, they filed a motion to vacate the judgment that was entered against Spearing GPS. They weren't served. Well, they well Spearing GPS. Um, Spirit Inc. wasn't in the case at all, so they wouldn't. I, I would have had a reason to serve Spirit Inc. So Spirit GPS was th th that's who the affidavit judgment entered against. Okay, and so then, so Spirit GPS filed a motion to vacate. Spirit Inc. I'm sorry, Spirit Inc. filed a motion to vacate after they merged with Spirit and GPS. Okay, after the merger. And then the court, the district court set the motion, their motion in for a hearing. That never happened because in June... They sent you a check. Yes, that's right. In June of 2023, they sent the check for 2020, of 2023 saying that the, the check was in payment of that, that judgment. From that, from the day I received that check until I think August of 2023, that GPS device was still live in my vehicle and active. They didn't never tell me that they were going to terminate the service in the vehicle. Never. Okay, I just want to be clear then. Who, if Sperian GPS sent you the check and you cashed it, what did you think it was for if it wasn't for this judgment that you asked right. to have? The, well, that's what I was explaining to you. The check came from Spearing Inc., not Spearing GPS. And the interesting thing is, I did never. You know, what, did you just thought that was free money, or who did you think? No, no, no. I, I, no, that's not what I'm saying, judges. What I'm saying is, is that when the judgment was entered on March the seventh of 2023, then Spearing Inc. reached out to the court and filed a motion to vacate the judgment that was entered against Spearian GPS. The judge did not vacate it. He, 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 he set that motion in for a hearing. Right, so it was never vacated. Right, and so then Spearian Inc. sent me a check, said that the check was to pay that judgment instead of, I guess, because my, my position was is that they were paying the judgment, then you knew that it was for that judgment. Right. What I'm saying is, is after the, after they they paid that judgment, or, or sent me the check to in payment on that judgment, then the device in the, the, the second device that Spirit Inc. had already installed in the, the in the vehicle before they actually merged was still active in the vehicle between April. But the device was the subject of your complaint, correct? It was the, of the, the Better Business Bureau complaint. I mean, if we keep. But in your complaint, with, I don't, I'm not talking about Better Business Bureau, I'm talking about the complaint in the district court. Your complaint in the district court was because of this device. Right. Because of the device. Right. So the complaint in the district court was because of this device. Well, that was the essence of the whole thing because of the, 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 uh, the, the, the original GPS device. They, Spirit Inc. came and said that we will. You put this in to fix the problem with the first device. That is correct. It was an then, upgrade to, to. And from then you said. They did not complete whatever they were supposed to, and so I want a judgment, and then they paid you the judgment. In order to use the device, you have to have a subscription. So they, 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 they did not provide the subscription for the device. So you're saying that you're suing for twenty five thousand dollars for the cost of the subscription? No, that that's I'm, if I can get to that point, I'm, I was tr trying to do a chron chronological. So once I got the check in tw in uh, June of twenty twenty three. In August of that same year, Spearian Inc. terminated the subscription in the for that the, uh, the that second device. I then sent them a check, or I'm sorry, I sent them payment with my credit card that they accepted for my own three-year subscription. But what they didn't do 
was well, reacted. You sent a payment for the credit card for your subscription for when? For and, and that is as soon as I, I learned that they had terminated the service because you can't use the service unless you have a subscription to utilize the service. So it was turned off because you didn't have a subscription. Then you buy a subscription after it was turned off. That that is correct, Judge. I sent they, they accept payment from me unless on the, that same month that they terminate the, the service. Right, and but how do they know you don't have something else that you want to have a service for? Because it can only that, that device is only assigned to one account. You can't pay a new subscription so unless. Then you need to turn the device back on. Y yes, you have, have to pay. Something? You have to pay because you can't have the device. And it, the device can be in a vehicle, but you can't. It's, it's useless unless you pay the subscription. So well, you pay the subscription. You're saying that should have turned the device back on. Or you it, have to pay th that is correct. If when I, once I paid the, the subscription amount in August of 2023, they should have turned this service back on. And how much was the subscription? It was two hundred and seventy dollars. And the reason that I wanted this in the vehicle because it affects the resale value of the vehicle if in the event that it's stolen. And we're talking to a thirty thousand dollar vehicle that um but you hadn't but you hadn't turned on the subscription prior to that. Prior to that I had not turned on the prescription because they offered this subs subscription uh, as a complimentary but they terminated it what in, the they terminated in August of twenty twenty three and then I Paid uh, paid for an additional twenty three year three years on that same month that I had discovered that they had terminated their complimentary. I paid them for the three year subscription that they accepted. So let me ask you this: um, So the car was purchased when? I had the car the same year that I got the Legacy Low Jacket. It was uh, twenty nineteen. That's okay. correct, Judge. So you have. I just want to be clear: before you got the subscription. The low jack was active, but you didn't have subscription, so you couldn't use it, correct? Th that is correct. You can't use it. They turned it off, and then they and then you got the subscription, and you still couldn't use it. So that's you're in the same place before, that is and they correct. told you to get subscription, you had, as it were, after when you paid for subscription, it was turned off. That is correct. They, they wouldn't turn the, the reactivate, the reactivate the device. And, um, so because they didn't do that, then I filed the instant, the underlying case. Which which is the, the this case in the district court, um, alleging that they had kept my money that I paid for the subscription and I don't have a device. But in the district court, you charged twenty five thousand dollars. And that is because without without the, the that is because without the the um, without an active tracking the active tracking device that they went in and modified the wiring in order to have the device in the vehicle in the first place was useless. And so it affected the resale value of the vehicle. And so now I'm out with out the uh, tracking device. So now if the vehicle is stolen, I'm out of a vehicle unless it's, it's recovered. Stolen. Right. At this point, it's not stolen. But the whole point is, is, is that if I... If, well, the only damage it is, Judge, is that what they did to the wiring. So you can't have that. The device is in there, but you can't make... It's useless without the subscription, and with, unless they reactivate the device, it's, it, 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 makes, it means nothing. Or so you get a new device. Then I have to have some pay someone to take the old device out, and we rewire it. And I've gone through the dealer Let me about that. Attorney, ask you another question, uh, Mr. Johnson. Um, so you, at some point, you amended uh, the case that you filed in this case to include new actions. That is. <laughs> Tell the court why you did that. What was in your mind? What led to that? I'm sorry. What's the date? That you're saying the amended complaint that the court ruled on. That's the one you're saying. Yes. Now? Okay. So after I had uh, filed a lawsuit alleging that they had accepted money from me and, and wouldn't give me the uh, uh, reactivate the device, they did, then a couple months after I had filed this lawsuit, they did turn around and they. Um, refunded the money back to my credit card. So the, that law, the basis of the lawsuit then was at that time moot. So then I did receive information that they actually. Okay, so I just want to be clear. You filed the complaint. They responded to the complaint, and then based on what they said in the complaint, you filed. You amended the complaint based on what they said. Th that is correct. Because what they said was is that they refunded the money, but the money wasn't refunded until after I had filed the lawsuit. And after they had filed their motion to dismiss, so therefore I amended the complaint because I received other information that indicated that Spearing Inc. was not um, what had been a forfeited entity. 
and wasn't was doing business. If I can just make an argument on that, he's being charged with bringing a bad faith action or, or uh, an action without substantial justification. Yeah, he's speaking of something as a legal term, forfeited entity. You need to ask him another question. Um, why did you amend the complaint, sir? Uh, I amended the complaint to allege claims of uh, under the Consumer Protection Act because I felt that Spear and Inc. had deceived me in its representation um, with respect to selling, I mean, with respect to installing the device in my the, the second device in the vehicle, without telling me that they were not they were doing they they they, they were not authorized to do business in the state. And once I discovered that information, that's what prompted me to file the um, amended complaint on those allegations on the Consumer Protection Act, um, saying that they felt they should have disclosed that to me because if they had disclosed it to me, I would have never did business with them and I would have never allowed them to make modifications to my vehicle because as I understand it, um, you have to have a warranty in order to use a warranty, you have to be able to do business in the state, as I understood yeah, it. Jackson, this is all it's this the and uh, Mr. Johnson, the circumstances you just described was, was that what led you to, to file that amendment? That is correct, and and I also when I filed that amendment, it was just based on the information that I received after the, the, the at, at that time, and that's why I filed that. Mr. Johnson, uh, let me ask you, when did you learn, uh, if at all, that Experian <coughs> GPS and Experian Inc. merged? I didn't learn that until after I received, um, I think it was sometime this year maybe when they had filed something, I think in this case, indicating that Experian Inc. was a successor in interest to Experian GPS and that was in, I think, um, I think it was in Set. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, some early part of this year, whenever they Spear and Inc. filed their motion um, saying that they were the successor in interest to Spear and GPS. I don't recall. I can't remember when that that pleadings were filed. And at, uh, at a time in this case, you had filed uh, 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 to uh, substitute some parties, right? That is correct. Why did you do that? Tell Judge Anderson why you did that. I did that because. Based on the information I had at the time, was that because Spirit and Inc. was uh, was not uh, in, based on the information I received, Spirit and Inc. wasn't doing business in Maryland, in Maryland. And so, based on my research, I believed at the time that I had to include other entity, the the Spirit directors, in, in order to save the lawsuit from being dismissed against Spirit Inc. Who, at the, who I believe at the time um, was doing, was not authorized to business in Maryland. And, and did you act on that belief and, and, and pursue that course to substitute those parties? I did. Okay. Um, you had also asked the Attorney General to, uh, or asked the court for a referral to the Attorney General to investigate certain matters. Can you tell the judge what was in your mind that led to you making those decisions? Well, it goes back to the uh, amended complaint that I filed on November the 30th, alleging that they, Spear and Inc., was not doing business um, legally in the state. And I believe in good faith that the court had the authority. I'm sorry, what are you relying on, sir, that you're saying your belief was based upon? I received information from the State Department of Assessment and Taxation that indicated that Spear and Inc. Do you have a document? That you'd like to introduce into evidence with that information? I, I don't have it up here, but I think my attorney does. Uh, Judge, do you want to introduce into evidence? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, if I may approach. Uh, it's too much. I don't think it's. I don't think it's. Why don't you show it to the counsel first? Is that attached to your office? No, it's. But I don't have it here. Of course, it's always true. Mayor, first, 
Oh. Yes, Sean, I'd like to speak to Mr. Figueroa or Loriana Figueroa. I think, I think this sheriff's head is too hot. Yeah, I don't have an issue bringing him up. I can't leave him there. It's super hot in the back. I just didn't want to torture him. Oh, okay. But um, I'd like to, but I'm happy to wait until we get a little bit closer to when the hearing's going to start, if that okay. makes more now sense. Okay, now I'm just trying to take time. I um, appreciate I get it. So, yeah, because you want to bring him up and then get back here. Right. If, if, we're, if we're nearing the, the end, I can go grab him, but if it seems to be a little bit longer, I'll wait. I'd rather wait until we get the tax. Okay. Okay, we'll wait. Thank you, John. Okay. You've shown her the document? I have, Your Honor. Okay, you can ask the question. All right. Mr. Jackson, uh, show you what's been marked as Exhibit 1. This is the uh, affidavit that you had actually filed in this case. As a matter of record, um, and it dated uh, March 22, 2024. Do you recall signing that affidavit and filling it out? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and show you here what's been marked as Exhibit D. Is this what you were referring to? Yes, it is. Okay, what is it? What is, tell me what, what that is. I had sent an email inquiring on the status of Sperian GPS and Sperian Inc. to the Maryland Department of Assessment and Taxation. And in the response to my inquiry... I'm sorry, before you answer your response, it's going to be hearsay unless you have a, a, a certified document from their counsel that you're going to admit? Uh, Your Honor, we, we do not have a certified document. What we have is, is the records of the State Department of Assessments and Taxation which I believe he's going to testify they relied on, showing at the time uh, in this, um, that Sperian Inc. Uh, was a forfeited entity in Maryland. Well, I don't know how to testify to that just here today. I think this is, a, this is a public record, Your Honor. I would suggest that That's why it's been certified. This is, it's, it's a public it's not, record? It has not been certified, but I'm not offering it at this point for the truth of the matter asserted. I'm offering it uh, for, as to the, the fact that this gentleman's good faith and what he believed when he filed the case. So he, he, he did some research, he found out that they were forfeited, so he, he amended to include some CPA claims. That's, 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 I'm asking you to consider that only to the extent that it affects his faith. Well, I mean, I mean, you just testified to all of that, he hasn't, so he probably should have done that outside of his beer shot. Uh, but counsel, what is your yeah, opinion? Your Honor, we have objection. This, this uh, email, we, and we've objected to it before and his other attachments. It's complete hearsay. It's from an individual who doesn't even say like what their title or position is. All I know it could be a mail clerk over at that office that happens to be his friend. So it is, this doesn't have any, any legitimacy or any, it actually doesn't even stand for what he says it stands for. So I just object to it. It's complete hearsay. Unreliable. It's, it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, Your Honor, so it can't be hearsay. It's, so offered it's being offered for what purpose? Circumstantial evidence of his state of mind, his faith when he amended his complaint to include the CPA accounts, uh, the claims. His state of mind is, uh, that's not how state of mind is used for the hearsay protection. Well, but his, his, but his, Your Honor, his, his faith is being challenged here, right? What he believes, it is alleged that he has filed a bad faith action. He's acted in bad faith or without substantial justification. I think certainly he has the, the, the right to rebut that, that allegation by showing that he was in fact acting in good faith on information that was then available to him. He's told you that he learned that 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 was unavailable. Why would that it be was, unavailable? That was then. Um, excuse me. That was then available. Then available. Uh, so, I mean, so if it's not hearsay, what exception are you saying that it needs? It's, it doesn't need to meet an exception if it's not hearsay. It's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. And I, and frankly, I don't think. Spurian actually it denies that they were not authorized to do business in the state of Maryland for a period of time. No, no, that's not. Again, that's the legal question as to whether or not they had to be licensed and registered in Maryland. That's not before this case. And we would have a position that we don't have any of these requirements that Mr. Johnson was trying to put forth. That's just completely baseless. But I'd also submit that the First Amendment complaint was filed on November 30th at 9.14 a.m., and what's the time on this email you're trying to get us at? I think it's after that. I wasn't actually offering the email. I was just going to offer the, the certified yeah, that records. That came in uh, like later on that day. So clearly you didn't rely on it. It's after, after the date and after the time from when you filed and prepared this complaint. Is, it, is that his time stamp that's on the document you want him to rely on that's not here stamp? 
Uh, Your Honor, this document is, is, has already been filed with the court. It's attached to his affidavit. Whether or not it's filed or not, you're saying that he relied on it, but if he relied on something that I'm he not. saw after the fact? I'm, I'm, no, ma'am, I'm not saying that. I'm asking Mr. Johnson just the questions. What, what his state of mind was when he filed the complaint, what his good faith okay, or absence was. Okay, she can cross-examine him on that then. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So, Mr. Johnson, what led you to file the amended complaint when he added it to the Consumer Protection Act? Well, after I received information that, to the best of my knowledge, was accurate at the time that I received it, is that um, I felt deceived by Spirit Inc. when it reached out to me um, to resolve my issues. And so if it had disclosed to me that it's right or that it wasn't authorized to do business, I would never um, allow them to make changes to my vehicle. So I felt that they had uh, misled me and deceived me into believing that they were acting in good faith. And what was the thought process that led you to file uh, the motion with this court asking the court to refer the matter to the Attorney General? It was based on the allegation that I had um, alleged in the complaint and I, in the complaint I, I alleged specifically that they were not licensed to um, do business in their own. Oh, yeah, in the complaint. The so it's, it's a stain that you have. Counselor, you're going to have to direct him and ask him the questions. Y yes, uh, Your Honor. Um, that, that might be the extent of my question. Okay, cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson, you attended paralegal school, is that correct? I did. Okay. And um, how many times have you filed a pro se action in this court? I cannot answer that. I did more than 10? Objection, relevance. How many times have you filed what in this court? Pro se actions in this court. For this case? No, in general. In That's this. not relevant. Um, Now, you make reference to a Better Business Bureau complaint. You filed that on when? It was filed on April the 6th of 2022. Okay. And you filed your complaint in this in the district court case that you've been talking about on April 25th, 2022. I'm sorry, March 25th, 2022. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And the complaint that you made with the Better Business Bureau, um, that was for the same device that was the subject of your complaint that you filed on March 25th, 2022. That's correct. That is correct. And that uh, Better Business Bureau complaint that you filed, you told the Better Business, Better Business Bureau that Experian had purchased the LoJack stolen vehicle recovery system. Is that correct? Say it again, I didn't hear that. In your complaint to the Better Business Bureau, did you tell them that Experian had purchased the LoJack? Uh, corporation and the, and the device that was the subject of your complaint? At the time, the information I had, like you said, I, I was dealing with m multiple different entities, so I, it was hard to decipher who was who. And so when I went on to their website, the only entity that came up was Spirian Inc. Spirian GPS did not show up on their website. Okay, so you told the Better Business Bureau that the GPS device that you filed a complaint about to them was related to Spearing Inc. Is that correct? Well, th this... She just asked, is that what you told them, sir? I don't, rec I don't recall exactly because I don't have the actual... Your Honor, if I can have this exhibit marked. Okay. As I get uh, exhibit one. Okay. okay. You, did you mark it? Hold on one second before you do that. Do you know who the stakes are in your case? It's it's John Bogan, we think, and I'm trying to She's text. Still out. She is. I texted Tom Walkerman just to make sure, and and I saw Mike Banks, so I'm going to text. I'm going to get somebody. Is that for both cases? Yes, yes, they're both fine. It's the same guy. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking for Michael Banks. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Yes, this appears to be the complaint that I submitted to the Better Business Bureau. Okay. And you state in the under customer statement of the problem, you say, I purchased the low jack stolen vehicle recovery system with early warnings for more than for more than nine hundred and ninety five dollars, correct? That's correct. And then you go on and you say Experian purchased the Low Jack Corporation through acquisition and doing so it legally acquired all low jack assets including user agreements and contracts and became responsible for all aspects of its predecessor. You stated that as well, correct? Um, I'm assuming that's a legal conclusion, but, but you stated I, that. it, you it was that. said, yes. Okay. Any objections? Are you asking to admit that you're on legal business? Any objection? I object, Your Honor. What's the basis? I, I don't know that it's relevant to this action. It, it concerns a Better Business Bureau complaint. It's not the subject of this. Everything well, no, else. To what he's saying is whether or not it was good faith or not. He believes certain things were in relation to the Better Business Bureau complaint. Perhaps. It's very relevant. Perhaps his portion of the statement could be admissible under a hearsay exception. I don't think that just in total, I, I think it's hearsay, and it hasn't been authenticated by the other people mentioned here. Well, he just authenticated that it was his complaint. He authenticated the, the second page. Can I see what it looks like? Can I see what he's authenticated? Right, he, can, he did the second part, the back part that says what his complaint involved. Is that what you're saying, counsel? I, I think that that is his statement, and he did agree with that. He just identified it to be his statement. So I agree that that part will come in, and the front part would not. Okay. We can't screw the front. Okay, the front will not be considered, but the back part, which he said his complaint involved, yes, it says, oh yes, it's page two of two on the back part. And it's, yes, go right ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. And Mr. Johnson, I want to focus again on the district court case that you filed back on March 25th, 2022. You testified at length about how you got a motion for affidavit judgment, correct? Correct. Okay. And isn't it a fact that in May 17th, 2023, Spurian Inc., through its counsel, Mr. Maloney, appeared in the district court case. They filed a motion, they filed a notice of appearance, and they also filed the motion to vacate that you referenced in your direct, correct? That is correct, and I responded opposing it, saying that they were not a party in the case. Okay, but you had noticed that they had filed something in the case. In May of 2023, yes, and I think the court set their motion to vacate in for a hearing. Okay. And then, while that was pending, on June 7th, 2023, you got a letter from the same attorney, Mr. Maloney, with saying that they were going to pay the judgment, correct? That is correct. And the letter that you've been referencing, so that we're all clear, I'm going to show you what is Exhibit 8 to the motion to dismiss the First Amendment complaint. Exhibit 8, sorry. To my motion to dismiss. This is the letter that you received? It appears to be something similar to what I did receive. It was after I received their motion in May of 2023, but before that, I think in April of 2023, is when the information that we later received 
is that they merge with Spirian. Okay. My I think. question though was this letter that is June 7, 2023, that was sent by a certified mail returning a suite and email to his email address. That's your email address, correct? Yeah, that's it. That is. Okay. So is this the letter that you received on June 7, advising you that they were going to pay, that Spirian Inc. was going to pay the Objection. judgment? In the I'm sorry, let me get the question first, and then I'll hear your question. What's the question? That was part of the objection. Oh, the question itself. There's no jury, so I, I, I think... I, I, it just didn't sound like a question, but it... it oh, okay. It, she started to read something that isn't in evidence. That was going to be the other part What's of the What's the question? I'll start over, Your Honor. Okay. So, I do... So, this letter that we have here is Exhibit 8, which is attached to my motion, which is attached to Spirian's motion to dismiss the First Amendment complaint. You received this letter. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Okay. And this is the letter that you testified about earlier that you received from Spirian Inc. advising that Spirian Inc. was going to pay the judgment for Spirian GTS LP. Correct? That is correct. Your Honor, this is already in the court record, but I guess I should mark it as Defendant's Exhibit 2 and have it admitted. You can mark it for purposes of this because it wasn't part of this hearing. Objection here, sir. I'm sorry. Objection to what? Objection here. She hasn't asked to admit it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Defense Exhibit 2, mark for identification. Your Honor, at this time we move to admit Defendant's Exhibit 2 as part of the hearsay objection. What is 2? 2 is the June 7, 2023 letter that was sent to Mr. Johnson, which is attached as Exhibit 8 to our motion to dismiss the First Amendment complaint, which sets forth that Spirian Inc. is going to pay the $2,500. Okay. Counsel, your... Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. Well, it's hearsay. What's your response? My response? This witness has been testifying all along about this letter. I think this letter needs to be in the record that he received it and it's saying they're going to pay him and he says he's been paid. It's not hearsay, Your Honor. Yeah, so you can... It's impeachment, but it's extrinsic evidence, right? So you can ask him about the letter and ask him what was said. So, Mr. Johnson, when you received this letter, June 7, 2023, you understood, did you not, that Spirian Inc. was going to be paying you the $2,500 for the judgment that had been entered in the district court case. Is that correct? I understood. When I received this letter, I understood it to mean that Spirian Inc. was going to pay the $2,500 judgment that was entered against Spirian GPS in relations to the legacy LOJAC device. And this letter was received after Spirian Inc. had already entered its appearance as a party into the case in May of 2023, correct? Well, I think in May of 2023, I received information from... that was filed in the district court case where Spirian Inc. was challenging the judgment in the case. I filed something in response saying that Spirian Inc. was not a party or hadn't been substituted as a party in the case. In lack standing, the court then scheduled their motion for hearing for... I think it was scheduled for August of 2023. In the meantime, I received a check in the mail and that check at the bottom of it had check for payment in payment of judgment and it was included in a letter for payment of the judgment against Spirian GPS in that case. And I think before then, Spirian Inc. and Spirian GPS had not merged. Okay, I didn't ask you about merge. I asked you if they had filed a pleading into the case and they had. Is that correct? As far as I do recall, they did file something in the district court case and then that was... I opposed them 
Sandy what I said earlier. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, with the when you oppose. So Sperian Inc. filed into the case a motion to vacate your affidavit judgment, correct? That is correct. And one of the things they said in that filing was that they had not been, that GPS, Sperian GPS LP had not been served. Is that correct? Well, it was my understanding, I don't have a plate in here, it was my understanding is that they were claiming that they had not been served with the, this, the, um, with pleadings in the case. Spear and GPS never appeared in the case. And so you and didn't serve them because they, they never were, appeared in the Spear case. Spear and GPS, uh, well, I didn't serve them. The court supposedly had sent a certified letter with the original complaint and summons to Spear and GPS. As far as Spear and Inc. is concerned, I didn't serve them with anything. And the reason is because they were not a party to the case, so I did not think that I was obligated to send Spear and Inc anything with relations to the filings in that underlying case. Okay, but well my question is, is a little bit different. My question is that with regard to Sperian GPS LP, when Sperian Inc. filed the motion to vacate the affidavit judgment, they, they stated that Sperian GPS LP had not been served with your motion for the judgment. Is that correct? I, 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 don't, I, do, I do not recall, but what I do recall is this, is that when I received... That's not a question. You've got to wait to ask your question, okay. sir. Now, you made a statement that you said that Sperry and GPS was in default in your mind because they never filed an answer in the case. Is that correct? In my mind, yes. Okay, and because they were in default, you felt you didn't need to serve them with your motion to vacate. Is no, they correct? were served with their motion to vacate because, well... I mailed it to them through um, through the mail because no one act actually appeared in the case for for me to send anything to them. So I wouldn't be sending Spear and GPS anything through MDEC. I would be mailing it to them, which I did to the address that was on the face of the complaint. And I also sent a courtesy copy of what I filed to the the, the attorney who. I have been dealing with for this all this this time at Sperian Inc. So she received everything that I filed in that case in, in responding to uh, their motion to vacate is attached as exhibits to my response showing how I served them, who I served, and with proof showing that they were served okay. with and my, my pleas. And that certificate of service did not lay out the individuals did it. I just said I served through MDEC. And then I also included with that the actual notification that I got from MDEC showing that the person who was actually served, because I had to actually add the person's name to it physically in MDEC by adding the service contact. And I added Anna Corcoran uh, to this, who I had testified to earlier about, to as a service contact because of, um, I had been dealing with her. So that's how Sperian Inc. discovered that there was a case pitting against Sperian GPS. Okay, but all, and you would agree all of that would be reflected in the pleadings you filed with the it, court? It, it would be. And we could take record notice of what you filed in that record? That is correct, because it's, it, it's, it's in my response to my um, opposite, actually I think I filed in this case too, what I had actually filed um, in response to Sperian Inc.'s I'm sorry, yes, Spirit Inc.'s motion to vacate the, the judgment. And I attached all of the, the service contact and all the, the evidence that supported the position that I, before I moved for the judgment that it was it was served on everyone, that it, at least all the contacts that I had at that time. Okay, Mr. Johnson, you indicated that you had purchased in, I think you said in August of 2023, um, after you received the settlement check payment of another uh, subscription or, or service period on this device. Is that correct? Well, I don't. Re I did not re view the check that I received as a okay. settlement. I right. viewed that but check as a payment of the judgment in that case involving the Spirit GPS. In August of 2023, because that whole time the, the, the device... All right, I can was, make my question very simple. Okay. So in August of 2023, you purchased additional service from Sperian. For that correct. same device that the they deactivated. Okay. That is correct. And in order to do that, you went onto a website 
through through a link. You didn't talk to anybody at, at Spearman. I, I did after I had after I had gone to the website and put my information in. It sent me an email saying pending fulfillment. Once I never got any notification um, saying that it was fulfilled, I then reached out to Spearman. Okay, Inc. Well, my question it was is, actually you started the transaction on a computer going into a a, a web page. Yes, I initiated the, the, the to, re, to renew it. That's that's the only way you can renew it is online through the Kahoo re, renewal, and you have to pay the subscription in order to uh, renew the, to the subscription for the device. And I did that. I went on the website. I gave my credit card information, and I received an email saying pending fulfillment. And then I spoke with someone at Spirit. Okay, I'm not asking you to talk about someone okay. who's not here in the courtroom. Um, your Honor. Right. Okay. Yes. I, I withdraw the objection. Read your uh, Mr. Jackson, you were asked uh, about uh, a letter that you received from Spirit and Inc. That's correct. W and you got that when? The letter I received was, I think it was in July 2023. Okay. And the events that formed the subject of, of the instant suit, the first version that you filed, those all occurred after that date, right? That is correct. Those are my questions. Okay. Thank you, sir. May I step down? Okay. Let's put the date for the argument. Yes, Your Honor. And this, this is a, a Zoom event, ma'am? Mm -hmm. What's that? If you sit by Zoom, yeah. the argument portion. Uh huh. So that should be 30 minutes, right? I would think so. I would hope so, Your Honor. Next Friday afternoon. That is the fifth. That's fine. Uh, at. Yes, that's fine. Ten o'clock? Yes, Your Honor.
Your Honor, if you would, uh, would you kindly con uh, continue to have hold my motion to withdraw and sub curia until the conclusion yes. of that hearing, please? And just remind me to bring it up again at that point on Thank the you. day. <coughs> we're still in the hearing to the case. Yes, so we're clear, yes, Mr. Johnson. Yes, you're still in the case. Because I have not made a ruling in the case of this proceeding. It's not finished yet. It's not complete. All right. Thank you. Okay. So anything that needs to be filed is to be filed through your attorney if you believe it's appropriate to do so. All right? All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. And I'm sorry. Just so we're clear, she was able to present her information. You're still in your case. So you would give your argument and she would have any... Uh, rebuttal to that. That's where we are for this. Okay? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you.